OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Right, you're very welcome along. It is Tuesday morning, it's half past seven. It's been a busy 24 hours in the world of GA, let me tell you that. And the Champions League is back tonight. And we have a Paul O'Connell interview for you. So, you know, there is no better place in the world to be than OTB AM this morning. Get in touch. 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment in the YouTube stream. You can get us at Off The Ball AM. Am I, am I going to am I gonna delay the inevitable? Are we, oh, we're going to power rank. We're going to power rank the football teams today. We're going to bring you some talking points for the Champions League. Power ranking is very difficult to do at the moment, obviously, because, you know, we have an All-Ireland champion who were fourth in the power rankings, which kind of abuses the power rankings, which, which kind of sends them into... Disrepute, I think. But you can wait, Owen. You can you can defend that. You can defend that later if you want, or you can try doing it now so that like we. How many goals did you concede in Killarney, Tyrone? How, why don't we? How do we protect the integrity? <laughs> it, it's not just the integrity of the competition; it's the integrity of the power ranking. Show us your goals against Tally, Tyrone. Is what I is what I'll say for and goals against since. <laughs> did anybody score a goal after that? No, did I'm they? pretty sure they never conceded a goal, and they never will concede a goal ever again. So that's why you know they're in at number one and cementing their place at number one and nobody will ever chisel away at that ever again or maybe actually everybody in the top 16 stands a chance of winning Sam McGuire next year it's one or the other there's no middle ground I mean there is no middle ground well the middle ground is that Dublin come back next year and are the best team in the country they are favourites for next year's All-Ireland Championship and they're just a bit better than everybody else and we still get good games next year where they're challenged in all their games, including maybe one game in Leinster and they win uh, a seventh All-Ireland Championship in uh, in eight years. That That's the middle ground for me. OK, OK. Well, look, we'll, we'll get into that whenever the um, the actual uh, slot that we're doing happens. I mean, there is some other news. I'm trying to find the full statement here so I can do justice to the news that came out last night. I have it here in front of me if you'd like me to do it. But I, I would prefer you to do it in, in your... Uh in your uh, tone of voice because I, I don't know what Ger has to say about this anyone but have you got the uh, Irish Independent there I mean they have it I, I can't see it it's not in the Times because he's going to editorialise by tone obviously I mean they're not I'm not editorialising <laughs> by tone I'm just giving it the cold hard facts Um, the the Kerry subcommittee is Tim Murphy chairperson Eamon Whelan vice chairperson Peter Twiss secretary John O'Leary Munster Council delegate and former midfielder Donald Daly, who's the Kerry Games manager. These are the men charged with uh, finding the, the new next, the next Kerry manager. I mean, I do think they missed the all-time great opportunity to headline this press release, ask my twists. I mean, <laughs> it's like you get this one chance in life, lads, and you blew it. Um, the statement is, the process of appointing the next Kerry senior football manager has commenced. The Kerry GEA Management Committee has appointed the following subcommittee who will revert with the recommendation at the earliest opportunity. They list the five names that you've mentioned there and then they say no further comment will be made until this process has concluded. Like, you know that uh, photo, the, the, the Joseph Stalin photo where one of his aides just mysteriously disappears? I can see, like, Peter Keane fading into the distance here. Uh, I saw someone on Twitter last night saying, uh, I don't recall saying good luck. <laughs> with the Simpsons uh, screenshot, uh, and that seems to have been what ha- what's happened here. It's it's if this if this is the end of Peter Keane, what a way to do it! What a brutal brutal way to say uh, I don't recall saying good luck and uh, goodbye. Your time is over. He basically has to reapply for his job. I suspect if he wants to be in the mix as the next Kerry manager, but this m- committee, I from a Tony Lean article here that I'm reading, met last Wednesday. So it's six days, five days later, they released this statement. So it's taken them quite some time to tell us that they have began appointing the next senior manager. So I wonder what's happened over the last five days. I mean, Jack O'Connor obviously has has walked away from Kildare just before that window began. It was early on last week. So I wonder, has that really put the cat amongst the pigeons in regards to their search over the last little while? Either way, if this is the end of Peter Keane, this is not the right way to do it. This is a really, really bad way to communicate it because, I mean, even if you think that All-Ireland medals are the only currency in Kerry and Peter Keane hasn't delivered that, you still thank your manager if he's not going to be the next guy. Now, maybe maybe they've had private conversations with him and, and we don't know for sure what's going on and maybe Peter Keane is, is well within a shadow of getting his job back and, and retaining his position. But from the outside looking in, it very much looks like 
he's been shown the back door here. So Peter Keane has worked for Kerry uh, at least since 2016 when he won the All Ireland Minor Football Championships. So 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. And instead of saying, you did great work, it's excellent, they're saying, you have to reapply for the job at best. At best, that's what they're saying. Like, uh, you've got to wonder about a county board that does its business like this. It lacks class. There's nothing classy about this statement. There's nothing transparent. There's nothing upfront. It does not speak to an organisation that is aligned. Like, you just say, Peter Keane is... Peter Keane is, has been asked to reapply for the job. Yeah. You say that. We're, the, we're, we're putting a trawl out there. Peter's term has come to an end. We're going to have an assessment of how well he's done. He's going to come in and tell us everything. But we're opening up the, the floor to see if anything else out there is, is any better. It's straightforward. It's honest. Everybody knows where you stand. We thank him and his team for the job that he's done over the last three seasons. We fell short. Like, tell, just say we, we fell short of what our standards are or what our expectations are. He's going to be given the opportunity to come in. Or we've already met with him and we've decided to open the process up. Because they've had that. They've had five days. That, that's, one of, that's, that, that's why I bring up that point, is that this committee met in the middle of last week and they've had that opportunity to get clarity into Peter Keane's situation about whether or not he's interested in reapplying for his job. To get perfect clarity, to provide the public with perfect clarity. Instead, the country is talking about this in a sense of has he been has he been pushed out completely here or, or what is the situation and it's, it's poor on Peter Keane for, from from looking at this but as you say if you're making Peter Keane reapply for his job there's no issue there no, so that's it. fair enough but just say it it's it's the communication here which is which has probably let them down a little bit I think and it kind of goes for some of the for, for this committee as well I mean maybe this committee are um I'm sure this committee are going through all the right steps in terms of reappointing a manager, but we just don't know this. We don't. I'm sure if you're looking at this statement and you're and you're connected to this, you're like, God, maybe that statement doesn't really reflect too well on me. I don't, I don't really want my name associated with that. So, like, there's a, a list as long as my arm in terms of the people who could possibly come in, and I appreciate that it's a very complicated process if you want to try and sound out the best appointment for the job. Now, whether or not they should be in that position is a story for another day because I feel that maybe the, the transition phase beyond Peter Keane perhaps hadn't been thought through before now. Uh, but still, I can accept how this might be a complicated process. But just tell us for sure what is going on here because is Peter Keane carry manager right now? Is he the front runner? Is he, is he done? I don't know. And he's hanging in limbo in a public sense. Like... This isn't this isn't very difficult to do, is it? It's like it, this is not rocket science. This is not SpaceX. This is trying to find the next person whose job it is to manage to carry footballers. And there was somebody who had that job, and his term is over. Like I think it's very straightforward to be able to communicate that properly. And I, I feel very, I, you know, you you feel on a human level sympathy for for Peter Keane. And if if he wins if he wins re-election after this, fair play to him. Yeah. But if, if they don't want him to win. They should say that. Like, that's the thing. You should just say, oh, no, look, he's had his, he's had his go. He can go off and, and come back different, chastened, better the next time. Go off and uh, have a, a long, soul-searching couple of seasons and somebody else is going to have a crack now. But, like, I don't know. I mean, who, who, who now is in the running for the Kerry job? Is Jack O'Connor immediately the favourite for this, in your mind, Owen? Or yeah. does Peter Keane still have... Like, is, is, is Peter Keane, you know, the possession nine-tenths of the law? He ain't in possession anymore. That's that's absolutely clear. Yeah, so. I think Jack O'Connor's the front runner right now. I, I think this all seems very protracted after the, the Jack O'Connor decision last year to walk away. The Jack O'Connor decision to walk away in the first instance to me didn't make a whole pile of sense. I, I obviously get the reasons that he outlined, but for me, if you can sustain those reasons with a team in Division 2 and to a Leinster final, you probably want to see the job through in Division 1 and maybe come closer to, to winning a Leinster Championship next year. So I definitely feel that he's interested in the Kerry job. Well, sorry, I don't feel that. I know that. He has said that he wants to come back and man manage Manchester, uh, Manchester United. United. So we, we know that. And we know that he's not Kildare manager anymore. And we know that he's left a pretty attractive up-and-coming county, in, in my opinion. So I would say that he is definitely 
gunning for this role right now. And I would say that the delay tactics that we're seeing here from Kerry GEA would suggest that he is very much the front runner. But if you've got an All Ireland medal, you are in the running for this job, as it turns out. The, the amount of names that have been thrown out there, and they all seem like relatively good suggestions. Every name you hear, you're like, oh, I, could, I could see that working, or I, he seems like a pretty smart guy. Like the, this is not a complete list, but the the, the the list of people who have been linked with this role in no particular order. Declan O'Sullivan, Seamus Moynihan, Tomas O'Shea, who's obviously off the table now, Jack O'Connor, Dermot Murphy, Morris Fitzgerald, Kieran Donaghy, Tommy Griffin, Paul Galvin, Mike Quirk, Aidan O'Mahony, Pat O'Shea, Liam Hassett, Declan O'Keefe. Like, and I accept that if, if you're going through all those names as somebody involved in the subcommittee, that is a very complicated process if you want to try and get through this list and actually find out who is the best coach in all these. I accept that, but well, again, it comes back to communication. Presumably, uh, there's a dream team element somewhere along the way, right? What, what's the... Is, is, well, is, are Jack O'Connor and Declan O'Sullivan, are they wedded at the hip? Is that, are we, do we see them as some kind of old and new... See, this, this I don't know. And it also comes back to this idea about what Dream Team will be allowed to come in. So if you're appointing Jack O'Connor, for me, I, I like whether you, whether you love Jack O'Connor, hate Jack O'Connor, have no feeling one way or the other about Jack O'Connor, if he's the manager, he should be given full autonomy, I think, or at least 90% of it to, to pick his backroom team, to pick the people that he wants to, to go into war with next year because otherwise it's probably not going to work. Like well, du- Duhur and Logan got everything they needed last year when they came in. They got to pick their entire backroom team. They got to put the team of, around Of them. course he will. That's Surely that's not even a discussion point, is it? But uh, with, with their last appointment, Peter Keane, and I, I think Donny Buckley is a fantastic coach. Everything I've heard about him is a fantastic coach. But Peter Keane didn't particularly want Donny Buckley. Donny Buckley was forced upon him. Well, then he shouldn't have taken the gig. Do you know, you say, no, not, this isn't my time. It's not your night. Yeah. Not my night. It's not your night. You, like, you're, no. It's, I'm sorry, but I ain't coming in to take this job with your guys. It's, it's me and my team, and that's it. Because I have my ideas. And I'm, I'm not spending my time at training wondering if my message is being given out instead. Like, in fairness, that situation... I think that carry football back significantly. They uh, well, look when it happened. Well, they obviously wasted a lot of time having arguments. What's the point of that? Well, he he, he leaves at the start. He leaves just before the pandemic, and everything post COVID has been not great for Kerry. Let's face it. Their high point was was nineteen, uh, uh, certainly under under Peter Keane, and, and Buckley was in tow that year as well. So I I, I think that you're right. Maybe that that that, that it did set Kerry back. And hopefully we do learn the full story over the next little while about what exactly happened in that breakdown. And let me just... So, I don't think there's a chance in hell that Jack O'Connor would put up with that because Jack O'Connor has the track record of having won All-Irelands and can say, look, lads, if that's what you want, that's what you want, you want somebody else. Mm -hmm. But you're not voicing a coach on me. But I think that should be the case for every coach. I think everybody... should be, yeah. Like, if if you are the manager, you should be given the responsibility to, to bring in the people that you want. Of course, you can make suggestions. Be like, this coach might work for you but at the end of the day it's your decision this idea that you have to make compromises on what direction you want to bring a football team because of what coach uh, somebody in the county board might want or, or, or what the, the perceived wisdom is doesn't sit right with me and again just to reiterate I think Buckley is a phenomenal coach and it would have been ideal if Peter Keane really did want it like that would have been the, the best case scenario possibly but, but it wasn't the case and Peter Keane was the county board's guy and if he's your guy, you've got to appreciate the guys that he wants in around him as well. So it's, I don't know, it, do, it, does, it, it doesn't sit well, the, the, the way things have been handled over the last little while, even though, and maybe it just complicates things having so many different people at play. The, the one thing that, that really, that, that's setting a, 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 a tiny alarm bell off for me at the moment is that it doesn't seem like they knew where to go when Peter Keane failed. You know who is the next man up if, if Peter Keane failed this this year? Do we? Do we? <clears throat> so uh, look, is there any revision after the All Ireland Football Final? Mm-hmm. And is it is yeah. there any positive revision, or is it all negative? Is it like, oh, look what we lost because if we'd beaten Tyrone, we definitely would have beaten Mayo. And I think a lot of people believe that, given the difference between Tyrone and Mayo wasn't really close in the end, and the difference between Kerry and Tyrone was a hair's breadth yeah. ultimately over the 100 minutes or however long the game was is there is there any revision that's like geez, they're actually they're really close yeah. no? yeah I don't know definitely or is Sa- the re- Saturday night was a good result for Peter Keane or is the revision 
my God, I can't believe how much we blew the opportunity, which is a negative. I, like do you I, see there's I, a difference between these two things? I, of course I do. And I think that the latter of those two points was definitely the prevailing mood. I can't believe w- we blew the All-Ireland. W- was, was Negative. The, in the immediate aftermath of the game. Now, now, of course, two weeks pass and everybody softens their their take a little bit over time. And then you see that performance and you see that, oh, Mayo also blew their opportunity in a more significant way. So maybe they shouldn't be looking through the prism of Mayo to judge their own successes, carry people, to be fair. But uh, there is that sense after Saturday that it was like, OK, the the best team in the country, uh, like, I mean, Kerry to come within the point of them, but like that, that, that is like a, a relatively defeatist attitude as well. So I don't know. I think his stock maybe is a little bit higher on after Saturday than it was before Saturday it still doesn't seem to have changed anything on this front. But ju- just one point I'd like to make is that it, it does seem that like when it comes to appointing coaches at, at all levels of Kerry, that maybe maybe something isn't right. Like, Because y- you do hear stories of people who go for roles and, I guess, offer a massive contribution to Kerry GEA. For, for me, if you're an ex-player who's won All-Irelands and you're interviewing for a job within the county board, which is, which is an, an underage coaching job or a manager's job, you're sitting down and you're offering something to the county. You're, you're doing it on a voluntary basis. You feel that you have something to give. And when you interview for those jobs, there should be a level of respect about even if you don't get the job, you should get a call back. You should be, your, your, your mind should be tapped into a little bit to see what are your plans over the next couple of years. We don't have a job for you right now. We don't think you're the best person for this job. Would you perhaps be interested in coming in on the backroom team? Would you be interested in getting involved with some of the development squads? What would you like to, to do to get involved with Kerry GEA? Because... If you're a young person who's just come out of the game over the last five, ten years and you haven't coached in the setup yet, the, the county board don't know whether or not you're a good coach. And, and I think trying to bring as many of those people in, in into as many roles as possible is the only way you're going to find out who is actually the best coach out of the list of the 12 names that I mentioned there earlier on. It, and it seems that maybe they haven't actually done enough to find out who actually is the best. Whereas Offaly are going to have a better idea of how good a, a coach Tomas O'Shea is than Kerry will in 12 months' time. Armagh currently have a better idea of how good a coach Kieran Donaghy is than Kerry GEA do right now. I'd like to know if either of those two people were, were, were offered uh, roles even as selectors uh, at underage levels over, over the past year or so. And, I, and I'd like to know what, what, what they did to tap into the to those two brains because the one information that we do know for sure now is that those two guys want to be inter-county managers like you don't get involved as a selector with our man Offaly unless you've got designs on being an inter-county manager one day but they've been left slip away to a certain point and I get that of course being a selector with senior inter-county teams is a bigger job than, a, than an underage gig with Kerry I, I get that totally but did they do everything to ensure that that brain power wasn't lost in the first instance all right if you're a Kerry fan, if you're a fan of other counties, a supporter of other counties, and you'd like to get involved in this conversation, we'd love to hear from you. 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. It's 7.48 this morning. Uh, Brian Cody's coming back for a 24th season, and there's strong rumours linking me all done here with the Galway job. So it's almost as if somebody was listening to James Scale on this show last week. Uh, Champions League, we're going to talk about that right now. We've got the power rankings at 7.50. Graham Hunter at 5 past 8. Of course, Staunton at 8.30 to talk about the Mayo situation. Uh, sports pages at 8.40. A feature-length Paul O'Connell interview coming your way at 8.45 this morning. And then Pat Nevin talking about the sectarian abuse that John McGinn got from Chelsea fans during the uh, game at Stamford Bridge the other night. A very interesting voice on this, given, of course, his close links with Chelsea. Uh, so always worth listening to uh, Pat Nevin when he's talking about this kind of stuff it is 7.49 OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette but your best face forward with their new and improved razors are we going to do the five Champions League stories first we are yeah let's do it so the Champions League is back tonight and I don't know about you but I'm really excited for, for these group stages more so than usual because as we all know last year was just this mental year where you had like Atletico win in La Liga, you had Lille win in France, you had uh, the unexpected happen in a couple of different places and with the new seeding system in Europe you have a couple of groups that are very tasty indeed and and the prospect of there being big teams dumped out early on. They don't look as invincible as they used to do in the the, the group stages for sure. So five things to to look out for across the the Champions League group stages. The first thing that we have to touch on is that the Paris Saint-Germain Manchester City group. The big question regarding this group is will Manchester City versus Paris Saint-Germain be a preview of the Champions League final on this season? And, And maybe it will be. It does look like on paper they are the two best teams in the competition right now. 
Manchester City looked like the best team on paper and the best team on the pitch last season and quite frankly Pep bottled it and I wonder are we going to get to a stage where this will actually start to haunt Pep uh, as, as he goes through this year's Champions League campaign because for me I couldn't see them being beaten last year not even in the Champions League final even though Chelsea were going really well and had beaten them a couple of times I just thought that City they had beaten Paris Saint-Germain comfortably in the previous round and looked like the best team in the continent and this was a procession to the title and it didn't happen for them and Pep got a huge amount of blame rightly I think after what happened in that Champions League final I think it becomes more complicated this year, which which is going to be, uh, and I think this is a factor as a result of the other English teams. Obviously, Chelsea are going to be somebody that people will be tipping for this title because they're stronger than last year. But Liverpool are back, and we'll get to them in a moment, as are Manchester United with Cristiano Ronaldo in tow. So I think almost last year could be Manchester City's chance, their, their real opportunity to win this tournament. And they were in such a good position to do so, having knocked Paris Saint-Germain out. But it'll be interesting to see if this is the final that a lot of people are saying as a preview in the group stages. For PSG, I think it'll be very interesting to see how they convert league on form to the continent. Like they will get out of this group, but what happens when they come up against a Chelsea or or a Bayern Munich? Like, will we get a r- real idea of the the space in behind Mbappe and and Messi until they're in the knockout stages of the Champions League? I don't know, maybe, maybe we get it in League On. Maybe maybe there will be uh, a, a couple of games where, where they manage to figure that out because that is definitely the, the one thing that you point to and say, is that going to be a team that, that wins the Champions League? But will Messi get over the line? Will it be a storyline as this thing rages on? The, the other thing is uh, that in this group, you've got RB Leipzig, the, the good guys of the group, doing it for the, for the small man uh, in this, the, the third wheel. And obviously they reached the semi-final two seasons ago. Haven't been great since then. They've lost, obviously, Nagelsmann since then. Upa Makano has gone since then. Kanate has gone since then. Sabitzer has gone since then. So they've lost a lot of their uh, best players. Currently 13th in the Bundesliga after a pretty poor start. So I would hold my breath if you're hoping for the good guys to prevail in Group A. So that is the Manchester City Paris Saint-Germain angle. The second thing to talk about here is Liverpool being in the group of death. And... I think it's pretty clear now that Liverpool are a much better team than they were last season and in a much better shape to actually go and contend and, and win trophies. Like Even despite all their injuries last season, I mean, they, 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 will, they will still come away from that Real Madrid tie with a few regrets. They managed to get to the quarterfinals and, and get knocked out by Madrid. It wasn't a disaster on the European front, but they've got Atletico Madrid in their group this season. They've got AC Milan in their group this season. They've got Porto in their group this season. So for me, that is the group of death. You look at the attacking talent that Atletico have. They started the season relatively well. They lined out with Luis Suarez and Antoine Griezmann and Correa in the starting team against Espanyol at the weekend and brought on players like Joao Felix off the bench. So so their squad is in incredible shape. For AC Milan, they've added uh, Giroud to to the squad. So Zlatan and Giroud up front is uh, one of the I guess one of the best attacks that well not one of the most um, notable attacks one of the most ageing notable attacks that in Europe right now and one worth watching and then Porto obviously eliminated Juventus and beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge last season so for me that is certainly uh, the group of death um, Manchester United then is uh, is another thing worth worth mentioning here for me they're the dark horses and this, this is the question can a, can a team with Cristiano Ronaldo be referred to as dark horses? Uh, the most, the richest football club in the history of the world. I mean, obviously, now they're no longer a nation state, but certainly if, yeah, if all the money had been put in instead of taken out, they certainly have generated as much profit as anybody else. Yeah. Maybe dark horses? <laughs> it's kind well, of like, I mean, oh, Italy are the dark horses to win the Euros. I mean, correct. are they really? It does, it does feel very Italy are dark horses to win the Euros. I mean, you, 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 like, they're, they're not exactly a nation state, but they're still uh, uh, like spectacularly funded. And obviously, a team at Ronaldo in it is never a dark horse. But I just think that the, the relative strength of the English teams in comparison to last season is the one thing that will put paid to any notion that Paris Saint-Germain or Manchester City are definitely going to win this thing. What odds do a team need to be to be considered? Dark horses. Twelve to one. <laughs> Did you look that up? No, I actually didn't. Is that is that bang on what they are? That's what they are. All right. Yeah. I think you need to be over twenty. Atletico Madrid, dark horses. Any yeah, okay. Men? Yeah, okay. Atletico, I can I can give you that. I I I think on a on a low key level, Manchester United's group is a very very tough one, and I think they'll be in a re- they'll be in a really good position if they come out on top of this group. Like I expect them to do that, but they'll have to work hard for it because. Got Villarreal. We all know what happened to them against Villarreal last season. And they've got Atalanta in there as well. Atalanta could possibly have knocked Real Madrid out of the competition last year. Pushed Paris Saint Germain very close in the quarterfinals the previous year. We all know about uh, their high pressing style and how brilliant it has worked. 
on the continental level and, and how well they do against stronger teams at Atlanta in this competition. So those two matches against them are going to be absolutely fantastic. And then they've got young boys, obviously, this week who won the Swiss League by 31 points last season. Uh, David Wagner is now their manager. And uh, you've got Solskjaer coming out this week saying this group is special as a unit. They look after each other and uh, talks about memorable historic nights for Europe at the club. But the aim when we go into this tournament is to go all the way. So Solskjaer not really shying away from the fact that Manchester United are, are certainly in it to win it. Um, the next thing, and this is a, a question you really need to ask yourself at the start of every Champions League group stages, is which is the hipster group? Which is the one that you would watch the BT Goal Show for mostly? And uh, it comes down to two options for you. So option one is Group C, which has Ajax, Besiktas, Dortmund and Sporting. And then the other option is Group G, which actually may not be a hipster group, but it might actually just be the crappiest group, uh, which is Lille, Salzburg, Sevilla and Wolfsburg. So I'm, I'm not sure. I, like, I mean, Ajax Dortmund, do they really fit into hipsterism anymore, given the last few seasons they, they've had? I would contend they do, they're considering getting back they're to selling it. clubs. Yeah, I think they're getting back to it, aren't they? Yeah. Like, uh, like uh, I don't, is, uh, watching Haaland is hardly hipster, though, right? Well, well, that's a good point, but... Watching Haaland. Oh, I'm going to sit down and watch the best footballer and most explosive talent that there's been in the last three seasons. And I'm such a hipster. But Haaland, the beautiful yellow, might be a thing that we will never have again after this. So he just about about gets in there. Like they're still very much a selling club. Sancho, not there this season. Ajax, not so much a selling club. They won won Eredivisie by 16 points last season. Obviously, quite... Uh, notoriously from a Tottenham perspective managed to hold on to their manager and uh, and their best players as well Besiktas managed to get Michi Batshuayi on loan from Chelsea and Sporting are, are the story of this group having won the Portuguese title for the first time in 19 years the previous season of course they lost Bruno Fernandes to Manchester United they lost Rafinha they lost Bastos they didn't really sign anyone but they brought in a new manager Ruben Amarim who for 10 million euros, 10 million euros to bring in a manager is the fourth highest fee ever paid for a manager. So for a team that wasn't investing in players, this was quite the risk to bring in this guy for such a big fee. He'd only been in charge of Braga's first team for three months before he came in to sporting. He's only 36 years of age and he helped them to concede only 20 goals last season as they won the league in Portugal. So so sporting uh, possibly the, the, the coming force. Uh, a coming force in Europe they, they won't win this thing but they're, they're certainly one worth watching and then obviously in, in the other group Group G as I say particularly hard to call Lille you might have said would be one of the teams to watch after their scintillating uh, performance to, to the league on title last season but things haven't gone their way since then they've lost their manager Christophe Galtier who came back with Nice at the start of the season and hammered him 4-0 which wasn't exactly amazing and then obviously they're, they've got a, a, a cohort of Turkish players who ever since the European Championships kicked off in the summer have had an absolute disaster. You would still be excited to see Yusuf Yaziki, who scored two hat-tricks in the Europa League last season for example and of course Burak Yilmaz but things haven't gone so well for them since then. So they are the hipster groups and then finally uh, the fifth point to mention here uh, is the new sheriff in town. It is of course Sheriff Tiraspol, uh, the Moldovan minnows in the tournament for the first time. Obviously the first time a Moldovan team has ever qualified for the Champions League group stages. You may remember them from such things as Dundalk beating them on a penalty shootout in the third qualifying round of the Europa League last season. They have been seeded into a group with Real Madrid, Inter Milan and Shakhtar Donetsk so they are absolutely finishing, probably finishing bottom of that group um, and uh, they would be doing well to, to, to finish third in that one. Sheriff, uh, a fascinating enough story. They've dominated Moldovan football for years. They've won 19 league titles since 2001. They've won nine of the last 10 titles and they have done six in a row. So they'll be looking to go on further than the dubs this year. This is hipster. Well, this is hipster. And, and it also is your, your, your geopolitics fixture of the week is very much Sheriff versus Shakhtar because uh, Tiraspol is the capital of Transnistria, which is a a breakaway state, a few of you might know, which is located on the Moldovan-Ukrainian border. Google its flag and you will see the Soviet logo on its flag. It is the only flag in the world right now that still has the hammer and sickle on its flag. So it goes to show what exactly its uh, its priorities are uh, in the country. It's not recognised as a nation by the United Nations, but if you described this to their faces as a Moldovan club, they probably wouldn't smile back at you. So uh, Sheriff is a is a 
a huge I, company within within the within the nation. It's it's not a nation that has a whole pile of foreign investment. So there's kind of like a monopoly for sheriff when it comes to like petrol stations and supermarkets and a television channel. And as a result of that, they've managed to funnel a huge amount of money into their club. So their sheriff stadium complex uh, cost two hundred million dollars. No other club in Moldova, other than the one other club in Moldova, owns their own stadium or training facility. So there is a massive chasm between them and the rest. Uh, and if you're looking for a couple of players to watch for them, uh, a player to watch is Adama Traore, but not that Adama Traore, a different one, a guy from Mali uh, who has uh, who transferred from Mets during the summer. So um, they've um, they've set themselves up to maybe grab third spot in that group. All right. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. That's your Champions League storylines to watch. Graham Hunter is standing by. We're going to talk to him in a couple of minutes' time. We're bringing you through the sports pages. We're going to take a quick break. We're back after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. This is OTB Sports Radio. Are you at peace now, 25 years on, with what happened in Mayo in 96? Oh, John, I, I get reminded regularly. Uh, Sorry. I happened to be down in a scrum today and I met a mead man and he kind of had a bit of a laugh about it. He's still blaming Pat McAneeny, incidentally, for sending off Lee McCain in the week today. We'll never forgive, uh, we'll never forgive Pat. Off the ball, Saturdays from 1 on OTB Sports Radio. Listen live on the OTB Sports app. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online. Then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited. Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Two minutes past eight this morning, and uh, I'm going to very quickly run you through the sports pages. Um, the uh, cover of OTBSports.com this morning Chelsea are furious. Pat Nevin on John McGinn incident. Pat Nevin said he'd been speaking with the higher ups in the club yesterday afternoon on his way down to London for the game tonight in the Champions League, and uh, that they are indeed uh, busy searching out exactly who was that was abusing uh, John McGinn from the Chelsea fans. Uh, he hasn't gone away. You know Cody given 24th season with Kilkenny. Instant memory loss is Niall Morgan's secret. That's Billy Joe Padden. And uh, Didier Deschamps has libel case against Cantona thrown out by judge. It seems that was on a procedural issue as opposed to on the substance of the case. Front page of the Examiner this morning, the right stuff. And it's Conor Myler's uh, the inside of his wristband, sweat and courage, are the words that he's got written. On um, looks like that's his right hand, unless the pictures, uh, you know, sometimes the way the photograph gets printed the opposite direction. So maybe he's lefty, is he? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, Hail to the chief? Question mark. Hail to the chief? Is the uh, headline on the picture of Michal Dunhu? Is he coming back? Galway board keen on Dunhu return. Is he keen on a return? I'm not sure. But if he is, um, I really hope that he doesn't take our hurling analyst with him because it sounds like he'd be amazing. David Fitzgerald had been linked with the position, was expected to be nominated by a number of clubs, but would not be interested in his name going forward. He was speaking on Ireland AM yesterday. Asked if he was taking up the Galway role. Not that I know of anyway, so I'm not. I haven't heard a word about it. Naturally, you'll have rumours around different things, and that's fine. I left Wexford six or seven weeks, and I'm enjoying the break. I'm with my local club, and that is actually all I'm concentrating on at the moment. So there you go. Is Doesn't want to man- manage Chelsea. Uh, no, what are we talk? What's Galway in the Premier League? Uh, Everton. Doesn't want to manage Everton. No, they recently won something. They're Chelsea. They are Chelsea. The, the unbelievable youth system, talent. That's like that's underachieving. Limerick. That's Limerick. Underachieving. No, no cur- currently anymore. underachieving. Oh, ch- yeah. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, Derek Ling is the manager of the Kilkenny under 20s alongside Peter Barry, Michael Rice, and Peter Donovan. Um, James McGarry, Martin Comerford, and Connor Phelan will be selectors for the Kilkenny senior team. Niall Bergen at under 17 and his backroom team will be uh, nominated. So that's it. And subcommittee to get right man for Kerry. That's the, the Kerry role there. Um, so. That is the story with that in the examiner. Uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, we have the right mix. That's 
Celtic are talking up his team ahead of the Champions League. Stars issue plea to co over catastrophic UK athletics. Uh, Hamilton, you look at life and realise how fragile we are. It's, uh, that crash at the weekend uh, might be changing a lot of things in Formula One. The Times, uh, Hamilton and rival order to calm down. Uh, Stars by coach solve crisis. Elliot foul on me wasn't a red. That's Harvey Elliott saying that it should have been a red card. Emirate Khan is on the front and back of all of the papers in England as they're trying to um, capitalise on her success in tennis in England at the moment. Who's that on the front and where is he? Why, it's Garth Brooks in Croke Park. He's coming back. What year are we in? There's a bang of the naughties off this whole thing. This is what we're going through at the moment. Like what, what? What else? What else other than Garth Brooks gives you the bang of the naughties? Even though Garth Brooks is throne house prices. Oh, I I would associate Garth Brooks with 2015. Twenty four. Sorry, it is 2014. Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Yeah. Okay. Just that by one year. I mean, but by that by that stage, he was a heritage act. Oh yeah, I was like I I'm still astonished by the interest that was shown in Garth Brooks all around the country. Uh, Garth Brooks is finalising plans for a series of concerts at Crow Park in 2022. Three shows, I think, is what they're saying, and not five. Um, and the, the, the Indo have the Keane has to reapply for a job as Kingdom open up process if he wants it. Shock Spain qualifier defeat adds to misery for Irish rugby. We haven't even talked about this just yet, but what a week for Irish women's rugby. Uh, beaten last night by Spain, 8 7. It's a shock, right? But Spain are one, one position behind us in the world ranking, so it shouldn't really be a shock when they beat you by a single point in a World Cup qualifier. But the other news that came through was that the IRFU, or somebody, had asked the Connacht players not to speak about the fact that they'd been asked to change in waste ground ahead of the Interpros at the weekend. So I, I, I don't know if you've all been paying attention to the fact that massive amounts of hyper are, are, are going around the Interpros. They're on TV for the first time and it looked like it was a quantum leap forward for the women's game. But then, of course... Uh, it says here, Keane Tracy says, the, the union were still dealing with the bitter backlash following last weekend's disgraceful scenes at Energy Park. Um, the IRFU reiterated that they apologised for an unacceptable error. Apparently the Connacht team showed up a bit too early and were, were directed to the wrong place and ended up having to change where... Uh, I mean, it didn't look like it was clean. So, I don't know. I, I, like, I, just, I just can't get my head around how that can legitimately happen. This is obviously like a just a, a terrible, terrible couple of days for them. But as you say, maybe the the idea of Spain rather than the the fact that Spain is is causing a bit more consternation here is a narrow eight seven defeat, and uh, it's Italy up next, I think. So it's um, going to be a, a really big couple of days for this team, but also not a not a great look if they can't answer questions about what was a pretty big story over the course of the last couple of days. No, it's rubbish. Uh, the Daily Mail. Uh, Spanish shock sloppy Ireland and keen to be interviewed for vacant Kerry job we don't we, he, you know I mean, look maybe he's keeping his cards close to his chest and he thinks if he wins this against everybody else who's out there it's, uh, it puts him in a stronger place who knows maybe maybe he asked for this yeah like we don't we, we, we don't know for sure flush out put up or shut up to all the other voices out there like we're we're just we're, we're just judging this on, on the nature of the statement but what would be interesting for me is that what happens to some of the backroom candidates that are being voiced as legitimate candidates for the main job if Peter Keane has to reapply? Can Does he go first and then when he gets told no, does Mark Fitzgerald, is he allowed to apply if he wants the job? Or like is Peter Keane speaking for his collection of, of coaches? Well, you'd, like, have to Tommy Griffin, he, uh, you'd have to assume that he has said, I'm going to go forward, I want you in part of my ticket, yes or no. You, If you're going to go on your own, that's fine. Yeah, you break ranks, I guess, but... Yeah, or you, well, like, I, I mean, you'd be more more mature than that, wouldn't you? Yeah, like I'm just I'm just interested as to, to how, how that works. Like I think the the if the the lack of clarity that we're getting publicly on Peter Keane is replicated inside, I think that could lead to a few uncomfortable situations. Is there any possibility? Just just thinking this through, right? Obviously, the news broke last night, but is there any possibility that actually this is what Peter Keane thinks is the best course of action? That he he understands how Kerry football works. And that if he was just ratified again, you'd have all the former players talking, muttering in the dark over the winter and on WhatsApp groups. But now what's happened is put up or shut up. If you think you're good enough to manage this team, you go to the Kerry County board, you put your, you put your PowerPoint proposal together and you say exactly what style of play. You tell us how much it's going to cost. You tell us who your coaching ticket is going to be. And you put that together. And if, if yours is better than mine, fair enough. I'll step aside. And then actually, 
what comes out of this is a two year term or three year term and it's 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 not just a limp on one year you have to win it or whatever is there any possibility that this is somehow what Peter Keane wanted versus the classless move by the county board that we think it is well I think that, that would be relatively brave from from Peter Keane but I guess it would also be quite smart I guess you, you, like you back yourself in the situation like the thing is Peter Keane knows that he will be out of a term anyway he knew that he'd be out of contract and that maybe the job would have been up for grabs regardless so I guess it's a bit of a power play for sure because there will be people who will hurl from the ditch and I'm sure there will be people on that, that long list that we mentioned earlier on that, that won't be any good at being a manager and I'm sure Peter Keane knows that himself so uh, like it's it's quite a, maybe you should be Peter Keane's advisor Jared. That, that seems like a, a relatively smart play actually at this point to, to try and say the good stuff away for nothing this morning Owen because we, we all know how every county works like, there will always be people who will who, who will try and bring you down a peg or two or say I can do better than that guy is doing when the fact of the matter is no maybe a few people could but the vast majority of them probably wouldn't be able okay. to two, two quick back page headlines we won't crumble Ronaldo teammate reveals United Stars refuse to eat puddings after seeing his healthy meals and uh, there was another one there a better headline Custard's last stand on the back of the star <laughs> health freak Ronaldo leads way as teammates ditch desserts is it going to be the lack of desserts that wins the Champions League for Manchester United Graham Hunter is with us this morning Graham good morning to you how are you in, in all, uh, GR, on, only on on uh, off the ball AM can you can you leap from an intense discussion about how Jar super advisor can undress the Kerry County board to Custer's last stand in the space of five seconds. I think it's what in football they call brilliant transitions. Hey, <laughs> uh, speaking of brilliant transitions. Uh, is is Cristiano Ronaldo like is is it news that sugar is bad for professional athletes? Is this the stuff that is this just puff, or is there actually something more fundamental when somebody like Ronaldo arrives at a club like Manchester United that is striving to get to the point where they are champions and they behave like champions? Like, is is there actually something in this that there were some bits of Man United the culture that was wrong? No, but listen. Um, do you remember that fantastic interview where uh, Roy Keane and his dog go walking with Gary Neville and he goes um, yeah I had a terrible game what was it against Real Madrid and I had it, it, was, it was an experiment with, with yoga two days before that had, had screwed him up um, and tonight it didn't fail to beat um, Villarreal in Dansk or be able to be closer to winning the title last season because they were on the apple crumble. Um, there's a really clear and easy way to talk about this, which is that Cristiano is patently um, not a fitness fanatic, but extreme. He's an extremist in making sure that there can be no habits that might creep in in his mid-30s that can detract from him being the best, the most popular, brilliantly paid, potentially a winner. Now, there, there are a lot, there's a big history of, of the media, particularly those who design back pages and front pages and big lurid headlines saying, there's a little detail that sees on it and blow it out of all proportion. Do you remember when <clears throat> Gordon Strachan was was winning the, the last league title, I think, for the Premier League, certainly with Leeds, he won the title in that team with Gary Speed and Graham McAllister in Canton or whatever. And at one stage he said that he, he had uh, porridge and bananas, whatever, for breakfast. And, and for years, it was like, if you don't eat porridge and bananas for breakfast, you're an idiot, you're a bad pro, this can make you play until you're 40. And we Gordon was like, it's just one of my thousand habits that helped me be fit and live at an advanced age. I just live well. Now, Cristiano is a little bit more excessive than that, and that's, that's all that's going on. It might be that because he's so particular about things outside any training regime he's had um, at any club. So, for example, when he moved, well, pardon me, when Walter Di Salvo, the Italian fitness trainer that was Cristiano's predilection, in his last time at Manchester United, um, moved to Real Madrid, Cristiano stayed in close contact with him weekly asking about, am I doing this, that, should I do this, that? When Cristiano was still at Manchester United, De Salvo was at Real Madrid, and the level of trust Cristiano, even as a, a relatively young man then, middle 20s, had in somebody that could give him 
not an inch of advantage, a millimetre of advantage. It, it, he was dedicated to that because he still believes, he still believes he can be named the, the greatest player of all time, not of the current era, but of all time. And he'll do anything, absolutely anything that's within his powers in order uh, to achieve that. That's all we're talking about right now, honestly. So right. I'm just chucking my tea and go with my apple crumble and, and custard. <laughs> I hope there's no sugar in it. Uh, Cristiano would not approve. Um, bring, it, bring it on, Cristiano. Can we talk generally about, obviously, we, we, we get right now to talk generally about the whole of the European competition and what we expect in terms of trends and, and where the, the relative power is. There's there's an assumption, and the, the bookmakers are certainly uh, leaning in this direction, that the addition of Messi to the front line at Paris Saint-Germain is a tipping point for that club in terms of reaching glory, and so they are the shortest price. But uh, it, it, were there not a lot of other clubs in Europe who had really good pandemic uh, transfers, uh, off-seasons, and talent recruitment and actually it it's this is not a, a shoe in for Paris Saint-Germain this season surely yeah I don't want to be picky about that but I don't think the odds are based on Messi Messi's a, a big draw he adjusts the odds but if you look at Donnarumma coming in and competing with Kayla so unless there's a big fall out there and it destabilizes them they've minimum improved the squad but potentially as good as Kayla is improved the first team Donnarumma is, is special. He's got things that Caleb doesn't have. I'm a, I'm a big, big Caleb or fan. And the reason that he's won so many Champions League, uh, so many titles in his life, is that he's also a ferocious competitor. But Donnarumma is not to be different. Adding Ashraf is also an extraordinary boost to what was already a, a very tempting side and a pretty extraordinary squad. It's so, all right if you go back to your point and say it's not just adding Messi, but the likelihood is that he can click with uh, Neymar and click now that the kit Mbappe is. Mbappe likes to play off the left coming in. Messi likes to play off the right coming in. That's going to leave an enormous amount of potential for fullbacks, wingbacks to, to, to overlap and, and really devastate him. Does it click? I've interviewed Pochettino already this season since the market uh, closed. And he looked, he looked pale and interesting. He looked stressed. And he, I'm not saying he spoke in a way that said he was worried, but he agreed that it was about how to make this work harmoniously now. Harmoniously in terms of pitch equilibrium, tactically, but harmoniously too, in that he's got such a, an ample squad. People are going to have to not take the pin when they're left out, rested, rotated, dropped even, call it what you want. There's a lot of fuss over why is Ramos not even showing his squads at the moment. Well, he came with an injury that was reported was going to take him until autumn to be fit for. So at the moment, I'm not particularly worried about the absence of Ramos. Let's assess what he looks like when he comes back. But I think they're, I think they're uh, overwhelming favourites for a good reason. They reached the final a couple of seasons ago. It's their dedicated goal. Maybe this more ample, more experienced, more aggressive, physically able squad that they've got now um, adds that little bit that they were missing, a little bit that they, they don't seem to be able to get, whether they're winning or losing Liga. It doesn't seem to be the right trampoline to be in, in perfect shape for the champions. I, I think that they're not an, a shoe in, but if they click, if that squad, not the team, if the squad clicks, they should win the treble. They should be a short price to win their first ever treble. It's it's an interesting one that you say it's not the ideal trampoline. Like there is almost this sense, I presume, from Pochettino's perspective, Graham, that you're almost dancing around this idea of winning the Champions League for the entire season. Like real realistically, we're not going to have any idea of how close they are to winning it until February or March next year. That that's a hell of a long phony war, really, assuming Paris Saint Germain continue to win games in League One. I know what you mean, but I think that um, by March we'll, we'll have a good idea because I think there's a strong argument that if they are tactically sound and they can keep their, their key six or seven players fit, match fit and injury free, then they're not just a match for any team. They should on the day be able to beat any team. Um, their games against Bayern Munich were astonishing last season, I thought. And I think they showed, I, th I think 
this is something that Pep Guardiola talks about an, an awful lot in an interview I did with them before the Champions League final last season. He said, yeah, <laughs> this season there seem to be little moments of fortune that are going with us, that have gone against us before. And he said, you need that. Now, in the final, it didn't matter. Damn, they lost. Um, and the little moments of fortune went against them, the, the extraordinary Rudiger tackle, the taking up, the blowing up, blah, 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 blah. So Paris Saint-Germain can't account for that. And if anybody says it's not a factor, I think there's irregular seasons in the history of the Champions League when you don't pick out moments of really nice fortune for a winner. Sometimes it's been so out of the park that there's a clear team that will smash everybody else. I'm not certain PSG in this first season of knitting everybody together is like that. But by, but by March... April, we'll know whether there's a click, whether there's a momentum, whether the squad are all pulling for each other and for the coach. And my point about League on is it's a league you have to win. It's quite a physical league. It's quite an athletic league, but it doesn't test you in a whole heap of high-class ways. You're not coming across world-class footballers. You're coming across well-coached teams, competitive, aggressive squads. But it isn't that that high level test of concentration and can you keep a world class opponent um, under wraps, which some of the other leagues, particularly in recent years, Spain and England have had. So I still think I say again, listen, it's going to be an interesting discussion. Discussion watching it. If Puro Pochettino can find harmony, then unfortunately we're going to find a new version of what we're buying called all those years Hollywood FC. If if Poch can't get them to pull together for one another, then it could be a horrible season for everybody in Paris. Right now, I, I would back that the will of the players who have gone there is so strong to dominate Europe, not just France. I still think that the bet you want to make is that they'll be highly competitive and potentially winners. That, that's probably the thing that we actually sometimes forget is that the, the owners obviously want to win this thing, but so does Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi desperately wants another Champions League medal as well, so there is that motivation. Just on, you mentioned Bayern there, uh, Bayern Barcelona tonight, or Barcelona versus Bayern, I should say, eight o'clock kickoff. You um, you famously predicted the, basically the A two on this show before the game actually happened. So it's their first meeting since then. Is there a sense that either of these two teams are coming into this tournament under the radar because it does seem that it is the Group A matchup that looks like a preview of the final in most people's previews. I think on um, when you look at this match, it's extraordinary in its own right because. And I've just finished writing a column for ESPN, so I can't bear not to mention the fact that every time Arsenal Bayern meet, there's something cataclysmic happened from their first competitive meeting, which led to the sacking of Johan Cruyff, through each of the, th- the three meetings in the middle of the short series of games these two clubs have had in Europe, really, if you think about the pedigree in their history. It's actually quite a concertina little start of games, but three times they've met one another and the winner has gone on to win a treble. And I think how few clubs that I want to travel and how rarely it happens across the history of there being, you know, the European Cup in, in this continent. I, I, then there's, you know, there's the, the 7-0 under when Tito Villanova is in his single season and the 8-2 last season. Right now, you, you, you can't, it's hard to see Barca even drawing this. They're not as far out of sight as they were when they went to Portugal to play that game that ended up 8-2. It was a single knockout punch. Um, Bayern arrive in better physical shape, in better athletic shape, they're taller, they're faster. They are generally a winning machine, and Barcelona are not. There's a clutch of players, this many, in the team, not just in the squad, who played once or twice, maximum three times since May. Ter Stegen has played once since May and, and looked that he needed games. There's a heap of kids who in the squad, at least on the bench, and, and who will get game time. Gavi, Nico, Ricky Pooch, who don't really know anything about the Champions League. And they've got a new striker who hasn't played once with the team, Luke de Jong, he will play up from Memphis. They're probably going to change formation. This won't look like... The, the, Barcelona was a club that went, well, since the big thrashing under Bayern, they went seven, nearly eight years and 38 straight games without defeat at home in the Champions League, scoring 112 times. And of the 38, 34 were wins. Now, since that time, there are two home games in the Champions League. Yeah, 7-1 defeat on aggregate, 3-0 to Juventus and 4-1 at home to uh, PSG. And what should be frightening for Barca fans, and enjoyable for anybody who wants to see Barca getting socked in the chin after so many years of being 
pretty dominant, or at least there or thereabouts, is the fact that Bayern play in a similar way to Juventus and Paris Saint-Germain. You know, give or take this and that. The idea is press, rob, push, attack, play aerially, um, make sure that Busquets can enjoy his night. And really, to be honest with you, if Bayern don't win this, I can't now. We're very recently, Barcelona were indomitable. It'll be a major surprise. A draw will be a little lottery win for Barcelona. That uh, seismic moment that you mentioned with regards to Cruyff being sacked in the aftermath of a Bayern game, that, that was the UEFA Cup semi-final in 96? That's it. It's uh, incredible to think that that was actually the fixture because like, when you said that, I, I ne- immediately thought back to 98, 99, but of course that was that was uh, a few years after Cruyff. So what were the circumstances in that situation? How bad was it and how egregious the sacking was it? Well, it was egregious because he was um, a great man wh- whose teachings, not just his choices or his trophies, the way in which he structured the, the um, development of the club, but also the philosophy of the club. Once they lost it, um, they stumbled relatively shortly after a bit of Bobby Robson and a short spell of Van Allen to a six-year spell for that trophy, during which guys who'd been selected under the, the Cruyff Reign to come into the academy came through and formed this, this golden generation, Xavi and Puyol and Valdez and Piquet and so on and so forth. So Cruyff's worth was still great, it would prove, but the two at the top, Nunez and Gaspar, had lost faith. They, they went to Munich and drew 2-2, so at that stage, Barcelona looked very, very good to go to Drew. It was the last chance of a trophy in 1995-96. Um, Cruyff was so uncertain about his future that a mid-season phone call he'd made to Zidane at Bordeaux to say, come here, son. He cancelled and said, listen, I'm not sure I'm going to be in charge. And when Bayern went 2-0 up at the camp now, even though there was a late goal for De La Peña, which if there'd been one more for Barca, 2-2 an extra time on a 4-4 aggregate, it didn't happen. I think Cruyff lasted about two, three weeks afterwards for sack in the dressing room before the final game of the season. They made a massive mistake. And just to throw into the seismic nature of every Barca Bayern game, because it's without exception, that 98-99 group that they were both in with Manchester United, and I think Brombu. Well, it was Barca's centenary, wasn't it? Um, they, the final was going to be held at Camp Nou. And Bayern beat Barca twice to make sure that Barca were third, didn't go through the group, and had to sit in their own stadium the next May for... Wasn't it a dull final? I can't remember who <laughs> won in 99. But I was sitting, uh, covering the match, about three rows uh, behind the De Boer brothers and Koku and Cliver. And they were watching the game as Bayern steamrollered. Uh, in, sorry, Fergie, I know you've not been. Manchester United for the large part of the game. And the Dutch contingent, not all Barca players at the time, but they left about eight minutes before the no end. No way. With, oh, yeah. Yeah, with body language. Ah. The, body, the body language was, why is it United down there, not us? We should have been blah, 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 blah. And while they were in their cars um, turning on the radio, this cash posh. Um, so Scar and sharing them 2-1 and, and that showed them why they weren't there because they didn't have that good spell. Heading back out to their mansions in Sitges and, you know, eating too much <laughs> of the of the uh how on the surround. Apple pie and custard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean <laughs> <laughs> They're a cautionary tale about achieving too much too young, that crowd. <laughs> Listen, at the time, that might be true, but they weren't, they weren't um, hard. And they were entering, they were in the middle of that desert that I talked about, where once Figo was taken away and by Florentino Perez and the Galactico era was restarted, Barcelona said, right, we're petrified of losing to Boer and, and Puyol and, and Koku. And they weren't just giving them gigantic salaries. They started to play, pay them anything between 20,000 and 30,000 euros as an appearance fee each game, newly introduced a contract to keep them during a spell where they went six years, six years without a trophy. There was something rotten in the state of not Denmark, but Camp Nou. And, you know, it, it was a funny time to be watching Barcelona. And it's leaner now. There, you, couldn't, you couldn't throw 30,000 euros at a new player right now. Things are so desperately bad in Barca's uh, finances. They've, since the uh, market, or just in the last stage of the market, they've assets stripped out, not always because of their own fault. Elish going to Leipzig is disastrous. Watch out for Elish Moriba. I don't know if other people have talked about him a lot in the show, but he's a gem. He's an absolute gem. 
Griezmann has gone to Atleti. As soon as he leaves, he starts to score in France. There is, but Emerson will be a, a decent player at Spurs, and he's better than Dest. He's injured and won't play tonight. There's there's a tight squad, and and the the, the trouble is in the short term, I think it'll cost them. But the green shoots are really interesting. Ricky Good should get more games. Again, two names that you won't heard much of. Gavi and Nico, both are in this squad. And Gavi recently made his, his debut at 17. Nico's 19. Nico's son of Fran, the brilliant Deportivo La Coruña, sort of 10, he used to pad about the pitch and was in that Deport team that thrashed European champions, AC Milan 4-0 up at the Riasor, that era of Tristan and Roy Mackay and Donato and all these beautiful players that kid's coming through. Pedri's back from his holidays. It, 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 there's a lot of extraordinary guys that really exceptional young talent. We're a bit green at the moment, but are going to be fun for people to watch over the coming years. It's just that they're playing real grown-up, angry, hard, winning-oriented men in the Bayern team. Well, and Nagelsmann's going to enjoy his first visit to Camp Nou, I think. Let, let's uh, wait and see how the kids get on. Um, there's a, a long tradition of some of those kids blossoming under these circumstances, so we, we can but hope. Graham, as ever, good stuff. Thanks a million. Enjoy the yes. tournament. I think that Depor team is the team that Shells drew nil all with. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're, they're definitely around the, the same era, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if they were all still there. Uh, I don't know if, if some of them had moved on by that stage, but um, we must get Stewie Byrne on to talk about that again because it was fairly sensational. The Champions League music, at the old and Zane Road as it was. It's 8.31 this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. What are you looking forward to about the Champions League? What do you hope happens? Um... How are the English teams going to do? There's a general consensus that the English league is now the dominant league and will be the dominant league. Miguel Delaney was uh, pointing to one of the TV deals that essentially blew the rest of the other leagues out of the water and as a result has um, tipped the balance back in favour of the Premier League. Now this has been cyclical in the past, it's just that maybe this time, well again, who knows, because if those kids coming through at Barcelona are as good as everybody says, then there's a new golden generation and if they can keep them together, and there's no reason why they shouldn't, then... Uh, well, perhaps the manager might be the reason that, that prevents them from um, fully uh, reaching their talent. We'll see. A reminder, OTBAM, as I said, is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved racers. We want to turn back to the all Ireland football final and try and explain, understand what happened to Mayo. I'm delighted to say Mayo legend Cora Staunton is with us to give us some sense of what the post-mortem has been like. Cora, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good now. Not too bad. How are you? Yeah, we're okay. What um, what has the post-mortem been like in Mayo? What what, what do you all think happened? Well, I suppose it's, it's probably a bit early days to dissect it. I suppose um, over the next few days, reading the, the, the local papers here will pro- we'll probably tell a little bit more. Um, but I suppose, yeah, f- from talking to Mayo supporters and, and uh, you know, obviously genuine Mayo f- fans coming out of Crow Park the last day and even on the road down on on Sunday afternoon, I suppose it's a, there's a lot of disappointment. Uh, you know, I suppose this was in all Ireland that we felt that, you know, um, we could have won, obviously, going in beforehand. We were probably slight favourites. And, you know, obviously with the big two or the so-called big two in Dublin and Kerry, um, gone that you know this was a huge opportunity and I suppose that's probably the biggest thing that there's a disappointment or a huge opportunity lost I suppose in the last few All-Irelands that we went in against the Dubs you know obviously the Dubs were favourites you know because they were um, you know obviously last year six in a row and, and, and previous years you know they'd won the All-Ireland so I suppose this Tyrone team um, were a little bit different they were probably unexpectedly got to the final a bit like ourselves so I suppose it was a huge opportunity and the biggest thing is that you know we just didn't perform in the day if you look back to other all ireland finals we were unlucky or you know own goals you know miss freeze whatever it was um you know we really you know put in a, in a massive shift and put in a massive performance but i just don't think that was there on saturday evening you know bar you know probably three or four players you know only played to the level they can if even that you know lee keegan and stephen cohen probably two in particular that you know, had, had a very good performance. But after that, you know, a lot of the other performances were below par, whether that was to do with, with you know, the Jerome performance themselves or just, uh, um, I'm not sure, the Mayo game plan or the Mayo system, you know, just they, they just never got going. And I suppose that's probably the most disappointing thing. I'm sure we'll get to that in just a moment. But is one of the reasons just the massive layoff and how Mayo are a team and have always been a team over the last five to ten years that love to play games on the regular like 2016 and 2017 arguably their greatest performances in a final 
came after a run through the back door. They weren't Connacht champions that year and they managed to put together a run and almost beat the greatest team of all time. Having four weeks off this year into an All-Ireland final probably didn't suit them. Yeah, so there was obviously that was a case and an argument beforehand, obviously with Tyrone with the two-week layoff and, and the, the momentum going in from that game. And then obviously Mayo with the four-week layoff. I suppose only James Horn and them will know. Obviously before the game, you know, he spoke about you know, the need probably for certainly the the third week with injuries, obviously, to Oshin Mullen. Um, and, you know, obviously there was uh, talk about Owen McLaughlin, you know, getting back. You know, I don't think that was ever going to be the case. But I suppose the performance against Dublin and who we'd beaten and the nature of, and to come down off that high, they probably needed the, the third week. But, yeah, I think certainly the four week, the fourth week um, didn't help Mayo. And, you know, you can obviously see Tyrone, um, you know, had the, had the momentum, momentum going in. But that said, I thought Mayo actually started quite well in the All-Ireland. You know, we were two points to nothing up. Um, so it wasn't like that we had a slow start and we're trying to crawl the game, to get the game back. I just don't think, um, you know, we never had the momentum shift with us. Um, I think, you know, obviously we had a lot of opportunities in the game. We had four, four, four you know, really good goal chances, in my opinion. Um, and we needed one of them to have a little bit of a, you know, a momentum um, shift in the game. And, you know, I think the Mayo fans and the Mayo players, you know, if that penalty goes in, you know, I think it gives the team a, a boost. And we, we kind of play off that, you know, um, you know, energy and stuff. And I don't think we ever got a moment in the match the last year where you could have said to yourself where we had that really uh, momentum shift and, and we were we were in the game. But as I said, by our start, you know, we were probably behind for most. So um, I suppose that's the most disappointing thing, the opportunities that we had. It's it's not that we didn't have them, but we, t- we took none of them where, you know, t- Tyrone had, you know, three opportunities on goal. You know, they took two. Um, obviously, Darren McCurry's one was saved by Robert Henry, but the disappointing thing for us is that we had the, the opportunities to really put Tyrone on the back foot, but we, we never took them. I, I totally understand the point you're making, and there was never a point really where you heard the full noise of the Mayo crowd after that second point was scored because, you know, Tyrone got a lead, Mayo got back, I think did draw a level at one point, but that was it. There was, they were never in front again. It's not really much of a strategy to base success in an All-Ireland final on momentum though is it like you, you actually need a better plan than something's going to fall our way and that'll get the team going so what's lacking in in the game plan or in this group at the moment that prevents them from saying this is what we're going to do this is our identity and we're going to win the game on that basis as opposed to something will break our way that drags us along yeah, well, in my, in, in my opinion, and this is just for me watching the game, you know, I, I sat with um, Colin Cooper watching it on, on, on Saturday evening and just even from speaking to him, I suppose at times, you know, um, you look at the game and, and I just thought a lot of the time we were so dev- devoid of, of any game plan in, in our forward, in our forward half, in, our, in the, the forward third of the pitch. I just didn't feel that we have... A, a structure that we know that we're playing to in the forward line. You know, at times we had Tommy Conroy, you know, chasing back, um, you know, on the Mayo 21. Um, we had Kevin McLaughlin at times in on the full forward line. Um, to me, Kevin McLaughlin's our playmaker. We need him to get on the ball as much as we can. Tommy Conroy has the speed and is probably uh, one one if, uh, of maybe two or three forwards that can potentially get goals for us that can score. Um, and I just thought there was no structure in our forward line. We lacked a huge amount of leadership up there. You know, people spoke about Killian all year and will we miss him? And, you know, the, the biggest worry is that we would at some stage. And I think we missed him hugely um, at the weekend. I don't think it would have been the, the change in our winning of the All Ireland. I'm not saying that, but I just think from a leadership point of view and from a system point of view, we missed him massively. Um, and I, I just think that the composure, the lack of composure inside, inside, the, inside, the, inside the final third was really, really poor, um, you know, and, you, and again, you look back to uh, the goal chances and they're probably the easiest ones to remember. You know, Aiden's first goal chance, his lack of composure, he's not a natural forward. They probably could have taken the ball ar- around the goalkeeper and had a shot um, or even looked across uh, across the square to, and Conor Loftus was there. You know, you look at Conor McKinnis pass across to Darren McCurry for, for the goal. That's the, that's the little inches, the little bit of composure that you need. You know, Tommy Conroy's goal chance where he's bearing down a goal um, and that's the time that, you know, there was an extra play in that. If he took a little solo and instead of trying to blast the ball, you know, just took that took that extra play and ha- gave himself more time. So, yeah, these are all the little things. But I really think our forward half, um, yeah, while we conceded two goals, it's the game we play. 
and we play a very attack minded minded game we are going to leave ourselves open at the back but if you're playing that counter attack football you have to be getting and, and you you have to create opportunities number one but more importantly you have to um take the opportunities and you know we had uh, i think 10 or 11 wides you know Connor Loftus when the game was in the melting pot i think it was maybe 110 to 10 at that stage he missed two crucial points Darren Cohen come on missed another one you know, to try and even you get the game back on, on level terms, we couldn't manage that. And I think, you know, it's not that you like to come back and say it's these old Mayo failings of, you know, trying to get scores on the board. To me, it was just that we seem to, we don't seem to know what we're doing um, in, our, in our forward system. And I, I think Aidan O'Shea is, is obviously a big one for that. And obviously he's taken a lot of criticism. It's not just on him, but at times when Aidan's in there, we're not kicking the ball in long. Um, and when Aidan comes out, he's the one kicking the ball in long, but there's no one in there. So... I just think there's no major system of play in there. And I think, you know, for Mayo going forward, that's something certainly that needs to work on. So, so what is the automatic fix or what would be the first thing you'd be looking at to, to change that, Corey? Is, is it just establishing Ed O'Shea as the focal point of your attack with more of a focus on Route 1? Or, or what would you be coaching if, if you were in charge over the next few months? Yeah, well, I, I suppose the biggest thing I'd be coaching if you're in charge over the next few months, we actually need to, again, try to unearth the, uh, uh, other talent, um, p- more forward talent, if, if anything, and, and possibly talent around the middle of the park. I think we actually got, you know, our midfield were very poor the last day. You know, and obviously Matthew Ruan was taken out of the game, you know, on a brilliant man- man-marking job by Kilpatrick. But, you know, Jeremoth O'Connor and Conor Loftus are natural club midfielders. You know, they're both, you know, wing forwards. You know, Conor Loftus is... You know, could be a centre forward, but we've kind of made do to bring them out there. So I think we need to unearth talent. But but going forward, I think yeah, we we need to come up with a system of play. If Aidan O'Shea is going to be in your plans, you need to decide where he's going to play. We can't have this d- debate. You know, for the last few seasons, is he a midfielder? Is he a number eleven? Is he a number fourteen? You know, I think his days of midfielder now probably um, you know finished because of his mobility and, and obviously he's getting on in age. But if he's going to be your focal point in the, in, in the forward line. You know, then you need to work on it. You need to spin the national league, um, leaving them there f- for the whole of the national league. Whether it has a, a big effect on ramifications on results, you have to go with it. Um, but you need James needs to come up and decide how how is a forward line are we going to play? Is there you know we look at our bench from the last year? You know, didn't really give us anything comparing to throwing bench. Is there players there that can unearth on that bench that can maybe they can convert into? A, into some sort of a, of a playmaker, into a into a forward or whatever it is. But if the likes of Kevin McLaughlin and Aidan O'Shea, are then we're going to stay. You know, you, you're going to have to decide: is is one of them going to be your playmaker at centre forward? Is one of them going to be your key man? With the likes of Tommy Conroy, Ryan O'Donnell, Killian's going to be back in there, so he's going to change it a little bit. But I think he just needs to decide what what, what way we want to play as a forward group, and from there. You know, to hone it right through the national league. Keep work, you know, because we cannot have. Yeah, it was more difficult this year. We we had a couple of national league games because it was cut short because obviously the COVID situation. But he really needs to hone in on that. And um, because of the type of game we play, we play such counter attack football that you know we we're going to get the opportunities. And um, when we get the opportunities, we're going to have to make them count. It's probably again you know going to need to un- unearth the t- un- unearth the Tommy Conroy or two. We need that crafty forward that you know. And knows when to shoot or you know um, or when not to. So I think it's it's going to be a hard winter for for these Mayo boys. Um, but again, I'm sure they they'll 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 come back and you know January and February. Um, you know, and and March will, will be when they're going to have to work on these things and and be ready for championship. Uh, Lee Keegan's performance was one of the all time great performances in defeat that I can remember. That when the goal goes in, he is the man who's like, no, we're not dying today. If we are going to die, we're dying with our boots on. And this is at a, a, a period in his career where we thought those types of swashbuckling performances were gone because of the hip injuries. Like, he has to come back for another season. Whatever Mayo need to do to tempt him back to explain, look, we're going to do this for you at some point. They they really do need Lee Keegan. Is there is there any possibility that he's not back, that he is thinking about retirement over the, the long winter? No, you know, I suppose only Lee can answer that. Um, you know, you have to look at it. They're around. You know, Lee uh, has a has a young a young baby, and he's been around a long time. And you know, any Mayo supporter would hope that he he wouldn't retire. You know, I'd be hugely surprised he would. But I suppose what people have to remember when you, when you've had that many defeats and and you're trying to come back year after year, it's it's very difficult. And you know, trying to you know, I know myself when I was playing, trying to get up every January or February to come back. Um, you know. It's it's fine when you're playing summer football, but it, it, it it's difficult slog. Um, I've no doubt that he'll be back. Um, but I I do think his performance the last day was you know, 
for for a guy that's you know coming coming up on 33 he, he you know he, he's probably uh, along with Kieran McDonald Mayo's greatest ever footballer um you know and that's he gives us performance um year after year all Ireland final after all Ireland final he's been immense so yeah I, I do think we need to keep the likes of Lee and Kevin McLaughlin I think you know because the team you, you look after that are, are, are quite young um you know Barry Aiden you, you go back you know it goes down to Killian and even younger so they, they do need to keep the leaders they've lost a lot obviously in the last um, last kind of 12 months with with the retirement or six or seven guys so they, they can't afford to lose um, any more leaders because I think then it could be that you know we're, we're going to be more in rebuilding phase so we need to hold on to our, our, our older guys um, and, you know there isn't that many I think Aiden Kevin McLaughlin um, and, and Lee are possibly our three that are that are over the age of 13. Yeah, this is a completely ridiculous question, but is there any possibility that there's a forward for a, a future for Lee Keegan in the forwards, that he is somebody who can kick long-range points and if you name him in the half-forward line, half-forwards spend so much time defending anyway, but every time he gets the ball, he's actually going to be coming from deep. Like, is it ridiculous? Uh, no, I don't think Anthony is ridiculous. I think you try all these things, um, you know, if you looked the last uh, time, I've said it many a time in, in the match, um, when Mayo were attacking and attacking at speed, whether it was usually it was Durkin or it was Keegan and or in fairness to Stephen, Stephen Cohn, I thought he had an excellent game. When they were attacking, a lot of the times they were looking to give that ball um, to a forward. They give it to a forward, but a forward was looking to give it to them, back to them. We were looking as our half back line to be our main scoring threat. Um, and that's where I think you know you need to take a little bit more responsibility as a forward and to, to take on that ball. I think really only probably Tommy Conroy once or twice in the game and, and Ryan O'Donoghue, who in fairness to him, tried to you know he created a lot of the goal opportunities they had. The first one for, for Brian Walsh and the Conor Loftus obviously missed when he kicked it along the ground. I think yeah, there's, there's, there's probably something that needs to change and whether that's Lee Keegan in, in a more advanced role or a Patrick Durkin, but. If you look over the years, I think some I read a stat maybe it was a gesture the day before in, in the number of All Ireland finals that Lee Keegan has played. I think it's he scored two five in, in them finals, which is remark remarkable from a wing back. So yeah, I, I do think someone like Connor Loftus is more of a natural forward. Do you play him there? Do we try and, you know, maybe try a Jordan Flynn Flynn at midfield? Yeah, no, I, I do think there's something has to change. You cannot do the same thing all the time. And I think with the likes of Oshie Mullen back there now, Owen McLaughlin to come back, that can give Lee Keegan the licence to, to move further forward for sure. Cora, great stuff. Um, I'm sorry for your trouble. <laughs> we, 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 we'll rise again and we'll fight for another day. I have no doubt these, these guys will be, ba will be back again. You know, they've been massive servants to Mayo. And yeah, while it's a disappointment walking out of Crow Park, you know, if you really were to look at the start of the year um, after all the retirements and then in, in, after Killian O'Connor went down injured against Clare, you know, people didn't ever think Mayo would win a Connacht title, never mind get to an All-Ireland final and beat the, the all-conquering dubs on, on, on the way. So, you know, while it's disappointing, massively disappointing to lose a final, it's, they've, they've probably overachieved in, in some regard. OK, good stuff, Cora. Thanks for uh, joining Thanks us this morning. That's uh, no Cora Staunton Gimmis. Um, I think that's all bang on, isn't it? The yeah, just one thing that's kind of come to mind there as well is that if we were going to use the uh, chastening experience that Tyrone had in Killarney to their credit over the course of the last few weeks, and we probably also need to factor in the sense that Mayo had no chastening experiences during the league, and I don't know when the last time a team from Division One, from Division Two, won the All Ireland final, but it's certainly been quite some time. Even a team to get relegated from Division One, it hasn't happened in quite quite some time. So maybe. Uh, playing Division 1 football next year actually trying out all those things that Cora outlines against there against the top opposition, opposition is yeah. going to be important Alright, the Football Pod is back live and free on the OTB Sports app from today for 24 hours the OTB Sports app is the only place where you can get the All-Ireland final breakdown here's a sneak peek at Paddy, Andy and Tommy reacting to the managerial news from Kerry Look, there's going to be a couple of guys there's obviously a few people have already kind of thrown their name in the hat uh, <laughs> I, like I, is, Johnny, I think, is Johnny and them guys going to go for it? Do you think? Like, I, 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 I just think with what Jack O'Connor's done, it's a done deal. Do you I would have thought. Yeah, but is that, not, is that not 50 years? He's gone years from Kildare. Oh, but I, I think, why is he leaving Kildare unless he's getting assurances that? Like, he was on staying on with Kildare. Nailed it. That, he was definitely staying on. He had decided that, to stay that on. That yeah. result happened, and then it's like, right, I know. You've got to think he's probably been talking to someone in there, and that's. It's teed up for him. Uh, who else? Chris Morris. Will Chris Morris go back? One of the couple of the, the, the recently retired players. Is, is it a massive ask, or do they want a safe pair of hands to go in there? Um, 
me and Andy could go in and do it. Don't know if that's going to work out. We play total football. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, look, it's an interesting gig. Cork are without a manager, Kerry are without a manager. There'll probably be a few more over the summer, lads, or over the, the does, over the autumn. So, does that make you feel like Kerry have more of a chance to win the All Ireland next year? Or they have less of a chance. Depends who gets it. Yeah, and I think I, I think you need to. We need to be respectful here to Peter Keane and his, his management team. Yeah. It's. Uh, that's that tonight is a tough night for him. Like it's mm. like he's dreamt yeah. he's, he's dreamt of that job probably all his life. Um, especially since he went into coaching, did an unbelievable job with the minors and it hasn't worked out. So um it's amazing to think uh tonight, like I, I don't know who I don't know who gets it. I, I don't know Anton kinda yeah. about the, the background, but it, it's for him it, it's probably unfulfilled and he's probably as as Paddy said there, it was probably not even the Tyrone defeat, it was probably the Cork defeat last year that has ultimately put huge pressure on this year. Like I say, Kerry, Dublin, there, there's a few counties there where... There's no rumours in Dublin, Paddy, is there? No, 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 no. It's, but just that if you're talking about Kerry, it's like, if you're not winning the All-Ireland, that's... You're, you're going to be questioned. That's a, that's just their tradition, their history. And, and for Peter and the team to have gone in there and savage amount of work. Like we're talking about the, the work players put in coaches, managers, selectors, mm-hmm. all with young families and jobs to come up short. They didn't end up getting over the line in all Ireland and ultimately that's that that's why they've gone for the chain. So let's like say it's one of the most high profile gigs there is. It'll be interesting to see how quickly it's filled. Like say there, there, there's not going to be any shortage of, of suitors for it. And you've got a pretty serious group of players there in terms of talent wise as well. Lots of people around around Kerry are going to be looking to get their hands in that job. Yeah. Massive news, breaking news on the football pod with Paddy and Andy. Uh, Eagle eyed Andy Moore actually spotted that one. Fair play to you, Andy. You must have a, a special tab there for uh, oh, stop <laughs> <laughs> the bath phone started ringing in the background there. <laughs> so red flashing in the left hand side of the screen. That's this week's edition of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. That's uh, an app exclusive, by the way. You need the OTB Sports app to listen to it today. You'll get it tomorrow, wherever else you get your podcasts. It is uh, time, though, for the Gaelic Football Power Rankings, the final ones of the season. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time for them, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. Going to do a recap from 16 to 1 today. Is, okay. that, fair? is that fair enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So so let me know when to stop here because my pacing has been an issue over the last few weeks. I think it's fair to say. <laughs> I, just, I just I wanted to get this thing out of the way and done and dusted with as quickly as possible. So, uh, number That's six. That's not how you sell an item. <laughs> this is going to be the most exciting power rankings of all time. That's how you sell this stuff, Owen. Nah, I'm, I'm bored by this because I hate my life. No, that was only the last two weeks. Today I'm excited by it. Okay, okay. You know, I'm, I'm listing off 16 You were totally counties. wrong. You were totally wrong. You, you like the bookmakers, had Tyrone at about 16 to 1. Tyrone was 16 to 1 before the semi-finals, everybody. Mm. Yeah, and the thing is, if you're going to go for the 7 to 1 on the semi-final, you may as well have gone the full 16 to 1 because you knew that they were going to be playing Mayo in the final rather than the other one not being played. So, yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I mean, it should have, could have, would have. It goes for a lot of these counties. Uh, number 16 is Offaly. Number 15 is Westmeath. Number 14 is Cork. Don't ask me to give reasons for all of these. This is like last month's uh, reasoning. Number 14 is Cork. Number 13 is Clare. Number 12 is Derry. Number 11 is Ross Common. Into the top 10. And number. I think you're going to be moving Derry up. I think Derry yeah. have the potential to make the first page next year. I think so too. I absolutely think that. And I think they could. Young get- Toll's back. Yes, and possible back-to-back promotions for them as well. I wouldn't be surprised to, to see the good times coming back for them. Ross Common at number 11, Kildare at number 10, Meath at number 9. Uh, Kildare are another one who, could, who, could, who should be flirting with the top page consistently. Kildare, uh, look, in terms of... So I think culture is important. I know it's the buzzword of the weekend, um, but... The, the culture has to be right and I, I don't think the culture is right in Kerry at the moment I think that that statement suggests that there's something wrong that the long term planning isn't there that the long term vision isn't there whatever however you're putting out a holding statement they've done that wrong whatever whatever they're trying to communicate has not been communicated 
beyond uh, uh, I mean I, it was interesting to hear Paddy Andrews speculating that he thinks it's a done deal essentially mm. now that was last night who knows what everybody feels this morning and my conspiracy theory about Peter Keane perhaps actually saying yeah yeah flush these people out so I don't have to listen to their nonsense and their bullshit for the next year or two years I don't know yeah it'd be a brave smart move uh, at number 8 is our ma. At number seven is Galway. And I don't know, Galway came to my mind over the last couple of days because when you look at what Tyrone have done, like you look at that 2018 season as a whole, Tyrone managed to come back from being beaten relatively comfortable by Dublin in that All-Ireland final to winning this year's All-Ireland. Galway were beaten... I don't I don't know the margins off the top of my head. I should, probably should have looked this up. But it, it did feel like a very similar game. Like, I know, didn't Galway miss an early penalty? I know Comer scored a brilliant... Against uh, who? Against Dublin, sorry. In the, in the semi-final. That was... D- Dublin's semi-final final pass was Galway, then Tyrone. In 2018. In 2018. And it just feels like... 24 to 212. Okay, right. It was an absolute hockeying. Tyrone definitely got uh, within a closer margin in the final that year. Okay, so maybe this point is a little bit off the mark, but it feels like Tyrone and Galway in 2018 weren't a million miles away from one another. 217 to 114 was the final, but it t- felt like Dublin eased up. It, di- it did. They were like, ah, oh, look, we're, we've 20 minutes left to go here, this game's over, let's just play keep ball. But the improvement that Tyrone have made from that point to this point is something that Galway can absolutely look at. And, I mean, they've made their managerial change since 2018 as well. They have. They were flying is before that, the pandemic. Is that working the- out? We'll- it, like, in your view, is is... The, is what we've seen from Galway under Porrick Joyce better than what we've seen before that? Like, they've they've thrilled a bit more. Their attacking play seems to be better in patches. But that second half collapse against this Mayo team this year was flaky. And also the way they failed to take advantage of a little bit of a Mayo collapse in last year's championship match as well. Like next year is a huge year for Port Joyce because things are, will be back to a relative case of normal. And when things were last normal, Galway were flying. Galway were the the the, the top team in football uh, before before things went to crap early last year. So next year is a, is a massive year for that county, and they'll definitely be one of those looking at Tyrone, saying we can do that. And same goes for Monaghan, who were in at number six. And the team who would probably regret it most from Ulster is Donegal, who were in at five. They, not only do they think that they can do what Tyrone did, they feel that they are better than Tyrone, I suspect. Yeah. Can be better than Tyrone. Yeah, I think this year's championship, you know, every county has a championship that they look back on and go, ah, oh. in retrospect, that was our time for Kildare 2010. Uh, I think Monaghan are going to look back on this year that's just happened and gone, oh, we still had McManus shooting the lights out. We have a bunch of young players who are coming through. We could have beaten Tyrone, really, if we'd like, not given them such a massive lead. Yeah. And even then, we almost still beat them. Like The Tyrone in the All-Ireland is, is, is agonising for a lot of people who they came up against this year. They edged out so many close games and uh, that, that's just going to leave a whole pile of regret for, for a lot of these counties. Now, Tyrone did have something that maybe Donegal and Monaghan don't have quite yet, which was the, the staying power to go all the way through and, and actually and actually beat Kerry and Mayo uh, on, on the way through. I'm not, I'm not convinced Donegal and Monaghan would have done that, beaten both teams. But Tyrone obviously proved that they have the quality and the staying power to do that. And maybe they, they're, we, maybe we just underrated them throughout uh, the, the, the early stage of the championship. And they, they peaked at a perfect time. Even b- like before COVID, we were saying that. I know we are sharing a clip of Ashling O'Reilly actually predicting Tyrone could win the All-Ireland after one of the Ulster games. Like So that, that, that there was definitely that sense beforehand that they were questing to, to, the wave, to, to, to their peak at a, at a perfect time. Um, number four is Dublin. Number three is Mayo. What? Number two <laughs> is Kerry. <laughs> and number one is Tyrone. <laughs> okay, okay. So you've taken the form line from the semi final where Mayo beat Dublin and you're you're keeping Mayo ahead of Dublin, even yeah. though Mayo collapsed in the last twenty minutes of an all Ireland final in the way that we know that if Dublin even on their last legs this Dublin team would not have collapsed that way. And they collapsed in the last twenty minutes against Mayo. Well did they though? Like they Ah, they did. They did. Dublin collapsed against Mayo. Okay, okay it's that, kind of hard to argue. It's it's dead, it they definitely did. It's why I think Dublin will absolutely be back next year once they... But they're fourth. To, they've fallen to fourth. Yeah, I, like, I mean, these, these, are, these are power rankings. Like, I mean, this is reactive. This is not so much... We can, we can do a predictive power rankings. We can, we can predict how things will go maybe in a few weeks' time or in a few months' time before next season uh, kicks into gear. But I think on, 
on a whole, at the end of the day, Dublin were the fourth best team in this year's championship. I feel. that That's my opinion. I think Mayo were the third best team. And uh, I think in, in hindsight, having seen Tyrone up against Mayo and Kerry, I think Kerry were the second best team in this okay. year's championship. I, actually, you know what? Dublin just need to suck it up. They played really badly in that semi-final. They played really badly in that third quarter against Meath. The stuff that we saw in that first half against Mayo was so good that that just gives me a little bit of pause for thought. I don't understand how the first half performance and the second half performance can coexist. It I know. It doesn't I mean, make any sense to me. I, like I was the one who was here predicting Dublin would, would hammer Mayo that day. I just thought that that performance was coming and it did come. And then all of a sudden disappeared and actually went the opposite way where their goalkeeper and one of their cornerbacks are playing one-twos inside their own small parallelogram. Uh, none of that game makes any sense and it is why... I think that there is still a little bit of the, the freakish pandemic sports nature to this year's championship to a point. Tyrone, of course, fully deserving winners. But there were, there were, like, I mean, there was a COVID pause right in the middle of it. So that is literally evidence of there being a freakish pandemic nature to this year's championship. I think there will be more of a, a resumption of predictable outcomes potentially next year. I do think football is going in a great place. and I don't think Dublin will be as dominant as they were before. But I think they can definitely win next year's All-Ireland. OK, and Kerry definitely number two, irrespective of who the manager is. If it's Jack O'Connor, if it's Eamon, if it's Morris, if it's Seamus Moynihan, if it's Donaghy. See, that, that's, a, that's a very tricky question. I, I, I'm putting Kerry in at number two here with, with Peter Keane. So that, that's the, the assumption that, that I've made over the last few weeks that he will be Kerry manager. I've completely changed that assumption now. I actually am now assuming that he won't be uh, Kerry manager. I think if Jack O'Connor's there, I would also be keeping him at number two. I think Jack O'Connor, Peter Keane, I, I, I don't think one of those managers is going to make a, a massive difference compared to, to the other guy, to be quite honest. So. Right, so it's uh, swapping in one manager for another. It's the quality of the players. It's the production line and the talent that makes them automatic number two. Are you putting an asterisk beside Tyrone's victory there when you're talking about the pandemic no. and the COVID. No. Are you... Are you somehow... that, way, that way you'd have to take away Kerry's joint league title this year, which well, you, I'm not prepared to give up. I mean, what you've just they're done there... They're half champions of a national championship. A lot of people, when, when we put those words down in cold black and white on the internet, Owen, and we, we, we tag you in the tweet... I know. People will get angry. I know they will. I'm, I'm well experienced in, in this manner. And please, please be kind, uh, social team. And, and I just, I'm, I think we need to keep pointing out the ghosts of Tyrone winning this year will echo down the ages for Kerry people. It brings back to the fore the proof that Tyrone's football culture in the noughties was superior to Kerry's, that they were the team of that decade and they now have started out this decade and they're going to be the team of this decade too and it's sickening because Kerry have never been the team of any decade. We've, we, I've just got a text in here from... It's the 80s. I've got a text in here from, from Damien Harvey who we had on the show last Friday. He said he deliberately placed us first to antagonise us. That's all the motivation we need now. <laughs> Talk about a county who are like creating That's the motivation they needed. out of absolutely nothing. Like, I mean, it was, it was actually inspirational listening. Like, here's the thing. I mean, Niall Morgan... Uh, said to us yesterday morning that he was reading all the stuff said about him after the semi-final like the it, what everybody says is you put the phone away you don't read anything uh, le especially late in the season but they were reading reaction to them in the in the aftermath of the semi-final before the final that is that is extraordinary now maybe somebody else is is like going through everything and saying right we need to get this to Nile or, or something like that maybe, maybe there's a, a process involved in that and well that's what the Irish rugby team used to do under Joe Schmidt they would get the clippings and then they would decide which bits they were going to use I mean we saw that we, we saw that um, Rob Carney in his book was talking about doing his comiskies after training to like he was using the Irish Times rugby journalist Gavin Comiskey as inspiration it, it, it didn't work they still, still didn't win a quarter final of the World Cup no, but it, like it's it, it's interesting though because like that was definitely a real critique of Tyrone in the semi final was that Morgan's kickouts didn't work. That was it was like Kerry won the, the that battle and they still lost the game, and it's just interesting how that was that was very much part of his thinking going into the final. Yeah, he was just doing his job, and it turned out that was the right job in the in the final as well. I I want to tell you about this. Okay, so that's this week's power rankings. Is that the power rankings done for the year, or maybe when Kerry get a new manager, we'll revisit. Yeah, we might we might do a predictive one later on, or or if Paul Mannion comes back. Or if Paul Mannion comes back, or if Jack McCaffrey comes back, or if Cluxton comes back, I think we. Will, I think if that happens, we'll have to do an emergency uh, 2022 power rankings. Okay, okay, that's a promise. That's the power rankings. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. Four minutes past nine. Last night at three o'clock, David. Blair and Stephen, three friends, began their swim across the North Channel to raise money for the RNLI. We put the map up there. Uh, they're doing it by relay, so 
they're each swimming an hour across the Irish Sea. It's going to take 15 hours to get from Donaghadee in County Down, Donaghadee, to Port Patrick in Scotland. The route is part of the Ocean 7 Sea Swimming Marathons. It's known for being one of the most challenging due to the freezing waters and the wildlife that will be encountered along the route. I don't like the notion of wildlife in the water. We're going to be chatting tomorrow morning with David Murnahan on uh, OTBAM after they complete the challenge. If you want to donate to help raise funds for the RNLI, who do so much work for people around our coasts, now more than ever, the RNLI, very necessary. Check out their Just Giving page. Uh, David Murnahan and friends swim for Dunmore RNLI. Up next, a very special extended interview with Irish rugby coach Paul O'Connell. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Dad pod. Just a video sure thing as well. Have a name. Podcast. Oh, midlife crisis. Howdy, daddy. Mm. Midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Dadcast. That's not bad, actually. There was a, a definitely a period of a couple of months where meltdowns were becoming more frequent and now when she's outside and she's sort of playing with the neighbours kids like if she doesn't get her own way the meltdown is quite extreme so maybe that's the terrible twos but I think maybe we've escaped the worst of it well I think the terrible twos is a bit of a misnomer because it goes into the threes and fours Dadcast Tuesdays from 3pm on OTB Sports Radio tune in on the OTB Sports app OTB AM with Gillette put your best face forward with our new and improved razors in a bid to raise a million euro by the end of 2022, Aldi and the IRFU are delighted to announce the exciting launch of their very first cookbook. It's called Home, and all the profits go towards Barnardo's, one of Aldi's official charity partners. It's available exclusively in Aldi stores nationwide for just 11 99 It features 72 delicious family-friendly recipes developed by the IRFU high-performance chef, Morris McGeehan, and enjoyed by Irish rugby players while on Ireland duty. doesn't say whether or not they come up with them or they cook them themselves, but we'll get into that in a minute. The recipes have been nominated by over 55 Irish players from the women's, men's and seven squads, and they offer an insight into Irish rugby and the healthy breakfast, dinners and desserts our athletes enjoy. Aldi's two new rugby ambassadors, Linda Njungang and Bevan Parsons, also feature in the cookbooks alongside Ireland rugby stars Paul O'Connell and James Ryan. I'm delighted to say Paul O'Connell is here with us. You've got two. You've got a, a chili con carne. I and three. A, a three, all right. Yeah. Chili con carne, uh, Guinness, which obviously, you know, nice. And what else? Uh, and uh, roast chicken. Oh, yeah, very good. Very simple. How much of the uh, recipe did, did you go, Morris, make me look cool here? Give no, me some well, they're my recipes, but then Morris puts a uh, Morris touch on them, you right. know. Like, if you ask any of the Irish players what's the best part to play for Ireland, they'll say it's Morris McGeehan's cooking. Oh, I swear. He is incredible. Right. The guy in the high performance centre, and he's passionate, passionate about healthy food, no waste, but uh, it's, it's a real treat to, to eat in the high performance centre with Morris's cooking. They really had to twist your arm to get involved with this project. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you, are well, you... he, he's the main guy in the project. I mean, and, and the fact that it's a charity is, is the reason he's involved. I mean, uh, he, he's a great guy, but it, the work, the work, the workload was on him. So he's done a great job. Uh, look, I, I flicked through it and um, it's there's loads of easy stuff. This isn't the type of thing that you're going to have to like five days of prep to make some of the stuff for. Some of it is more complicated than others, but there's really very easy stuff to do as well. Like. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great cookbook. It's a brilliant product and uh, and it's great for Bernardo's as well to for all all the profits to go to Bernardo's. They're a great charity. So, uh, so it's a great initiative and hopefully it's a big success. Talk to me about Morris and, and nutrition and how your career, uh, the, the science of the food changed. Like when you joined, yeah. was there any science around the... the no, well, it's funny. We might, I'm meeting Jerry Flannery, you know, in a little while. Uh, he's over with Harlequins playing Leinster. But uh, I remember we were in the academy. So we were in the kind of Irish academy. There was no provincial academies then. And... It was brilliant, uh, but they had a bit of a way to go as well. But I remember we, we, we got a big, we got a nutrition talk from a nutritionist and then they were providing lunch for us. And lunch was a white roll with ham, cheese and coleslaw, you know. So they've told us uh, uh, what to eat and how to be disciplined and how to plan. And then, you know, the IRFU have supplied us with uh, <laughs> a, a bread roll, essentially. So it's come a mile from then. You know, a nutritionist used to be quite ap- academic, but now they have to know they have to know their stuff, but they have to be able to build relationships with players as well and find out what's going on really behind the scenes. Yeah. And they have to make things practical. That's the challenge. And, uh, you know, I would have... Some of my best scores were towards the end of my career when... 
What I'd scores actually, are you talking about? Is it body uh, fat? Or I suppose it, lean mass and body okay. fat, yeah. And it would have been really because I remember sitting with we'd, we'd a scrum half with us on loan, um, Toby. I'm after forgetting his second name, which is a, a shame. Uh, he was a brilliant guy, but his wife was a nutritionist. And I remember sitting with her and I was eating an omelette and it was only egg whites in the omelette. And she was saying, why, why is your omelette so white? And I said, well, it's just an egg white omelette. I took out the yolks to get rid of the fat. And she said... You know, the way I am, I'm a slow gainer. She said, there isn't a pick of fat on you. You eat, need to eat more fat, not less. And uh, and I started looking into that and chatting to Jason Coleman and, and things like that then. And I really, uh, from then on, stopped taking fat out of my diet. I kept fat in my diet. And I went on a period where I was probably in the best physical shape I was in, but also I was a little bit less injured. Yeah, and, uh, it's not a coincidence, is it? Yeah, it's not a coincidence. I think, you know, the guys that are obsessed with it it actually gives them a bit of anxiety and they get a bit stressed over the guys that are about guys that are about 85 percent are the guys that get the most value out of it you know you hear roy Keane the other day well, talk that's it, about four percent yeah it's not good for you you know you i think that took about a year and a half off his career at the end yeah. well, not in the hip obviously but like it's not a, again it's like he was starting to get injured a lot and sick and it's like your body can't cope with the strains you're putting on it. Yeah. So the science has improved to the bit where you can get good resources now, I presume. The kids coming up at 18, 19, they're not getting bread rolls, they're getting access to this type of thinking. Yeah, they have good habits. It's, it's habits, you know. We all know what we should eat. It's just what are your habits and how well do you plan around it? Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what a lot of nutritionists have gotten better at, is, is giving people or players the tools to eat well rather than telling them what they should be eating. Yeah. Uh, what about your weight? Did that go up and down a lot over your career? Uh, yeah. I was always... I was always... It is very important. I was always trying to put it on. I mean, I'm, 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 I was 112 kilos. That was my fighting weight. I mean, from what I hear in, in, in England, you wouldn't get a contract now unless you're 120 as a second row. Right. So I was the kind of skinny second row that jumped in the line out uh, and you know probably then the scrum I had to work very very hard on on my technique because I knew I didn't have the, the bulk or the size but it, it didn't fluctuate but I mean I played against New Zealand at 105 kilos which 7 kilos less than yeah there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a second row in any of the academies I would imagine playing at 105 kilos now and um, how did you get down to that you just had stopped doing all the, the eating or no what? no that was I was only 21 I just hadn't okay, put right. on the side I remember that season I'd gotten to about 108 but then you get injured and you can't go to the gym and you're you're playing games all the time so that's stripping weight off you you know so um, and are you eating like two chickens a day at this point and is it has it got to that level um, yeah I was yeah and, and you know when you try and eat very clean that's when it's hard to put on size I think you know it's when you're not afraid of putting fat into your diet so if you'd been piling on the peanuts and the a crisps, bit of peanut butter fine. and yeah full f not not eating low fat milk and you know full fat butter and full fat milk and not cutting the fat off your steaks or your rashers yeah. which we used to do you know because Jerry Flannery used to do it because so Fl Jerry Flannery and Dunica used to influence a lot of the guys in, in, in the diet side of things so we'd all be copying them whether it was right or wrong <laughs> and for Flannery it was vanity as much as it was about performance so uh, but I even remember reading about Michael Phelps we were calorie counters one time in Spala and it showed that me and Dunica were burning about 8,000 calories a day Right. so no matter how clean you ate you couldn't get that in you needed to have fat in your diet yeah. and uh, I remember reading a thing about Phelps's diet and the amount of, you know, he was having mayonnaise and he was having all these things because he was training so much, burning so much uh, calories that he needed the fat in his diet. And I was, I was a little bit similar. Did you enjoy all that kind of part of the job of learning about that kind of stuff? Yeah, loved it, loved it, yeah, loved it. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that part of it because, again, they were, it was the no talent stuff, you know, it was, it was, they were all very controllable. Where did you get the no talent thing? So just this is you want to be world class at the stuff that doesn't require talent. Where did that I come was from? Just I don't know. I, you know, you heard you'd hear things like control the controllables. I don't think I was ever involved with a coach that ever said that, but um, but it made sense to me. You know, I probably I, I'd taken up rugby at sixteen, 
a little bit later than a lot of guys so I was always a little bit behind in some regards so I was looking for ways to catch up maybe and uh, those were the kind of things where you could steal a bit of a march on people the control the controllables I know you know Ellen Keane very well um, we had her on during the week and she was like this was finally the time where I understood what it meant and one of the things she did was uh, she would text everybody at 8 o'clock saying right that's me done now from the phone I, I won't hear from you again you won't hear from me again and it was finally being in that Gosh. position where different pennies had dropped for her along the way and obviously she ends up winning gold so but she'd been telling herself to control the controllables for a long period of time it's great saying these things but actually actively yeah. doing the little bits where it means something practical, that's quite a leap. Yeah, you need the process. So, so you know, like e- even people would say uh, focus on the process, ignore the pro- performance, ignore the, the big game or the results or whatever, but you actually need a way to focus on the process, you know. Um, um, and again, you know, the IRFU... The people they would have gotten involved in in various stages, you, you learn those things. So, you know, Joe had a thing called the big rocks, where it was about figuring out what was really important in your game, and working hard on those, and ignoring all the small things. You know, he used to talk about winning the moment in front of your face, which was a great way of, I suppose, as well, ignoring the result of the weekend. You know, it might the best thing you could do now might be just to go to bed early. You know, the next thing after that is to get up on time, uh, you know, eat a good breakfast and you just accumulate moment after moment after moment until you get to the game on Saturday. And even the game, you're just trying to focus what's right in front of you. So you get these little, maybe little one-liners or little phrases or you see someone else doing something and it, you, you realise that's what you were looking for and you, you copy and paste it or you copy, paste and edit it, edit it into your own way of preparing. So you need to magpie a little bit from other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, got, you have to be kind of open to that though as well. Like if you're singularly focused on stuff and particularly when you end up being a captain, it's grand focusing on the moment in front of your face but there's strategy involved particularly in cup rugby or... Uh, you know, as the championship comes towards the end, that uh, I can't just focus on this one particular moment. We need to, I need to be thinking a few steps ahead here. How, how do you merge those? Well, there's things? a time for that, isn't there? There's a time for planning, uh, planning ahead, and there's a time for sitting down with a piece of paper and looking at a few what ifs. Um, but it, you know, it, it certainly isn't. It certainly isn't right in the in the thick of a game, you know, or or else it's or else it's when there's an injury and you're talking to the out half about right. what's next, and you know we're fourteen points up, or let's take every kick we get now, or or else we're fourteen points up, let's not kick any more kicks at goal, let's go to the corner all the time, or, yeah. or whatever it is. But there's a time for planning ahead. Um, it certainly isn't in the in the heat of battle, you know. Yeah. Um- that obsessiveness that you had and, and I don't know if obsession is the right word but interest in, in making things better what did you do with that when you finished playing and before you became coach how, how did you like <laughs> um, yeah it's probably why I missed rugby you know it's probably one of the reasons I, I missed rugby uh, you know I remember talking to Gary Keegan before about some things and he asked a similar question but it's only when you have a problem to solve that, that you really find out the real uh, bits and pieces of, of what goes into solving it. You know, I would have worked a bit on TV and you might look at a team's mall or, or whatever, but and you're previewing it for TV, but I actually don't have to solve it. I don't have to figure out how exactly to stop it. Make yeah. sure you stop it. See who else in the world has stopped it and how they've done it. And can we copy paste and edit a bit of that or whatever it is you know it's only when you really really have to solve a problem that you get into the nuts and bolts of it you start picking up the phone to people you start and you start heading down all these different paths so um so that's probably one of the joys of coaching is is you're back in that world where you're trying to solve these little problems so the tv was a gateway drug for you to get back into coaching <laughs> yeah that's it yeah, yeah so that, it does sound like that because you had this knowledge and store of information and were wondering what you were going to do was it inevitable that you would get into coaching were there other pathways that you thought actually you know what i've got enough going on here i can i can have a slightly uh, an easier <laughs> life yeah i think uh Certainly, I would say three or four years before I finished coaching would have been something I was very focused on. And then 
And then maybe just towards the end, I, I, I certainly got a little bit nervous of, of it. And uh, and I was glad I took a step back and I was able to dip my toe in. The RFU were very good to me. I was able to dip my toe in and do stuff with the academy in Munster. I was able to do stuff with the Irish 20s. Um, I ended up in Paris for a little while. Um, and then even, you know, I, I, I wasn't coaching for a year, but I would professionally but I would have been coaching in, in Young Munster which is my club from time to time which was great fun um, and and let you re- let me realise really how much fun it could be um, so uh, was it inevitable I, I, I think there was there's a whole load of things I have in my head that I'd love to that I was always thinking I'd love to try that or or I think I understand what a player is going through there. I understand what a player is going through there and I, I think I understand how I could get a player to do that because it's very hard in rugby. You're close to exhaustion all the time and you have all these habits throughout your life of doing something. So you can't do a three-minute drill on Tuesday afternoon and expect to change the habits of a lifetime under pressure with 50,000 people watching you when you're exhausted and you've just come out of a scrum. So th- that empathy towards players and maybe what they're going through is something I experienced because I had that where I was, you know, I, I was trying to do all these things I was being coached, but it wasn't clicking. It, it, it's, it's, it's very hard, you know, and, and sometimes I think, you know, you've you got to wonder which habits can I change from a player here? Because we have to do the scrum, we have to do the line out, we have to do our exits, they have to get some rest. Uh, we also have to travel this week. We're not going to get a whole lot of time to develop his catch pass or develop, you know, his sidestep or, de- or or whatever part of the game yeah. it is. So it's it's about trying to pick and choose what you can change. And maybe my closeness to playing lets me feel a bit of that sometimes. And that was a very transferable skill into coaching. So it, it felt like it felt like it, it was fairly inevitable that you were going to head that direction. You mentioned Paris there. Was that a setback or was that like just a staging post along the way? How did you feel at the end of that? Because it, it lasted a year and we all kind of thought when it started, like this is it now, Yeah, the top 14 is next. Yeah, I uh, I look back now and maybe I, I'm a bit disappointed I didn't stick it out. Um, but we kind of disagreed with how we were going about things and I'd ultimately signed for one year. So, you know, Mike was moving on to Racing um, and ultimately I decided to step away but it is what it is I'm not it would have been great to have spent four or five years there uh, to have been successful with the club but it didn't happen but it, it doesn't break my heart I, I really wanted to live in France that was one of the big things I, I'd love to have lived there longer and mastered the language um, but it is what it is. And do you learn from that then? Like, you're, you know, like the one thing about sports people is that they lose a lot. You, you suffer setbacks a lot. Yeah. And it's part of the job. And, uh, you know, it's all those cliches about how you respond is more important than actually um, learning to get up. I, I, is that something that in coaching you're prepared for as well? You're, if you're in coaching for the long haul, at some point you're going to get fired because that's the game. <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, like Bill Belichick got fired by the Cleveland Browns and he's the greatest sports coach in any sport ever. Um, it, it, it's just part of the game. Are you prepared for that or, I or not? Say, I would say I am, yeah. I do, you just have to, you have to work hard. You have to do your absolute best at the job. You have to keep an open mind and, you know, you've got to let the cards fall then and, and live with that, I think. You know, I, the only thing I'd be disappointed with in Paris is... I suppose, you know, I'd, I'd real confidence in in the way Irish rugby was was ran and the way we did things, um, and you know, you just got to be open minded to other people as well and other people's way of doing things and other people's. It's not even their way of doing it. It's their if it's an ingrained belief for someone, you know, you're not going to have a short, sharp conversation and, and change their mind or or you're not going to change your mind. It, it has to happen over time. So I think that open-mindedness piece or even, you know, what you were saying, that curiosity piece around why other people do things, there's a whole load of learning in it. And uh, I think as a coach, it, it helps you massively because you're always going to be coaching with people who have a different way. No, no one will look at the thing the exact same way. So 
it's a real challenge trying to get on the same page sometimes and it's a skill to be able to try to be able to get on the same page with other people when you're coaching so in retrospect it sounds to me like you were doing you were practicing that skill and that muscle when you're on lions tours asking people how do, how do you do that tackle what, what's your technique for that yeah yeah and even even i remember graham roundtree did a great thing in the 2013 tour he just brought the english line out calls you know because we'd had 2005 and 2009 where we'd kind of tried to please everyone and we'd we'd invented these brand new line out calls for both tours which when I look back at it now, you're better off having, you know, we were using the England line out calls, which gave the England players a little bit of advantage. But at least there was a group of people that knew all the pitfalls. And In the last minute when we need to go something safe. Yeah, they exactly. know what it is. This, this is the one. And, you know, when I started doing this, this is what I struggled with. And when we played South Africa before, this is the only flaw in the system here that we need to keep, or, or whatever it is, you know. And then you guys like Jeff Parling and Tom Youngs, who knew it inside out and didn't really use it as a tool to get themselves picked, you know, they were very open. Um, so, so, and I remember, you know, Ian Evans, the Welsh second row, real good guy, struggled with it and, and, I, and the two of us were struggling with this. So I was saying, listen, if they can do it, we can do it. We just have to spend a bit more time learning at it. And I don't think, you know, I don't think he ever got the, the hang of it as well as he could have because he actually wasn't open, open-minded open enough really to, to... or No, that's unfair on him because he was. He just, he, he had a bad experience with it and it kind of set him back. Whereas I was kind of saying, listen, I'm just going to live in Jeff Parling's pocket here until I get it. Yeah. You know? And that was you practicing your coaching. Yeah, it's probably, the same, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the same curiosity that you need. So how do you get, how do you become a better coach now? Like what's your into the future who are the people that you can learn from obviously within the Ireland setup but are you, you said you're picking up the phone who are you picking the phone up to that you can trust that um, well everyone and, and anyone um, really uh, you know Larry Fisher has been a great resource for me for the last year because um, he's pretty curious about what we're doing and he's curious about this side of the world having been here um, as well I mean I, the first day I spoke to him on Zoom he had a, a monster uh, hoodie on which you know, has to be 16 years old, 17 years old. Uh, and Good quality I remember, gear. Huh? Good quality gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so he, he's been great for me. But I, I spoke to loads of coaches. The teaching thing is, is the challenge, you know, is I suppose that's what a lot of good coaches, Brian Cody or John Kiley or Stuart Lancaster or, or even Noel McNamara of the 20s. I think Graham, was Graham Henry a teacher as well? You know, was, so yeah. many... So many good coaches or teachers, you know, they're qualified in how to transfer information. So um, the rugby part isn't that hard sometimes because, you you know, you have so much access to footage through the through Opta online. You know, you, you, it's a great network of coaches, players that you can chat to. It's it's the changing habits and the transfer of the information is where the, the, the real gains are, are, are to be made for me I suppose and that's something that you can work on over time or is it something you need to you uh, just got to talk to people and read things and try things it's it's hard to try things in you know when you've only 12 matches a year and every one of them is more important than the last but uh, you know I do a little bit of work with a school in Limerick I do a little bit of work with uh, an under 12s team in Limerick I do a bit of work with a young monsters whenever I can in Limerick so it sounds you like get that, to try things a bit well I was going to say it sounds like you know people are listening to that going oh that's just volunteering and giving back to the community or it's fun but it sounds like as well it's actually you tra- practicing skills and it's it's not just a one way relationship you're actually picking stuff up yourself yeah yeah it's it's, it's both yeah it's um, it's giving back but it's you know, I don't think I'd do it if I didn't enjoy it. I, I really enjoy it. So it's uh, it works both ways. Can I ask you, as somebody who's been involved in high performance for as long as you have, watching what's happened in Limerick and with the hurlers over the last while, how did they do it? And what are the lessons that the rest of the world can learn? Because it seems like what we've seen is an entire culture where skill and hard work and the uh, the suppression of ego has yeah. somehow coalesced with this bunch and I don't believe for a second that it's a coincidence that a, you know, oh, it's just a, it's a fluke that a bunch of great young players come together at the same time. I don't buy that. I think that there's like structures there that we should all be going down and going. Oh, I, I don't think it's, it's not a fluke at all, in fact, but it's, it's just, 
I think in any club, any anyway, rugby club, anyway, for sure, you need you need you need a head coach that wants to win the European Cup this year, you know, and is willing to do anything, sign anyone, do anything to win it. But you need someone else in the club, I think, that wants to win two in a row in ten years' time. And I think Limerick, the big investment has been in underage setups and knowing all the players in the county. Uh, getting them into academies. I mean, I was down walking in UL the other day. Uh, my boy was starting that my rugby tots training, but Limerick under 14 girls were camogie training, and I ended up chatting to the coaches. But it was brilliant to see brilliant training, real high intensity, high high level. But you know, I don't think rugby brings in kids at an under 14 level and 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 coaches them and and teaches them about nutrition and teaches them about. Um, strength and conditioning uh, and all that kind of thing so I think there's been a massive investment in the underage and widening the, the pool at underage level and letting them know and making them part of something and, and the, getting the gear And uh, but the biggest thing is the volunteerism I think that Limerick have managed to recruit and you know I, I remember going to speak to the Limerick Miners six or seven years ago and Joe McKenna was the guy that uh, was I think managing them he was the guy that ran me to come in I know that Eamon Cregan was involved I think there's a guy Shane Fitzgibbon who a lot of guys speak you know all incredible volunteers who you know didn't you know winning the All-Ireland this year wasn't uh, relevant to them they just wanted they wanted to win it in 10 years time so and I think something there's something special about volunteerism and the power of volunteerism as well. And and is that even a word? Volunteer. It is, yeah. yeah. Volunteerian, the volunteerism. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. and I think that's one big thing in 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 Limerick hurling that I see, and the, and the quality of the people that got involved is is pretty amazing. And is there are there lessons there? Is there an automatic transferal to rugby, for example, that? Like the school system works very well for Leinster, it's pumping out players. But actually, what you're talking about there sounds like we need to get back to allowing clubs to be a pathway for players as well. If we're going to broaden that base, yeah, yeah, massively. And uh, like, I, I think in rugby as well, and it's where Ireland, in the professional era, I think has managed to uh, separate itself a little bit. In in rugby, coaching is. You can make massive gains with with, with good coaching uh, at underage levels for sure. Um, you know, practicing the right things. Um, you know, I I think there's sometimes you know you look at cup rugby and there's probably a big emphasis on the line out because it's such an important part of this of 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 of, of getting possession and stopping the opposition from getting possession. But really, once the line out's over. All the skills you learn in the line out have nothing to do with the rest of the game, you know. Whereas if you're a backline practicing backline moves while the forwards are doing line outs, you're actually getting better at rugby, you know, you're doing you're passing under pressure, you're doing running lines and all that. And I think sometimes with underage, you know, the the emphasis on catch pass, that's the real that's the real uh, place where the gold is, uh the emphasis on footwork. Um, that's where the where the where the real goal is. I think a lot of those skills like line outs, uh, rocking, they can all be learned a little bit when they're older. If they're really good catch passers, you're in a very good place. You look at a lot of the tries New Zealand score. You know, people talk about their physical prowess and their speed. So much of it is down to their incredible catch pass. So, so there is an opportunity there for us for sure. If 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 we can. You know, maybe have a look at what some of the other countries are doing, and Ireland make a great job of it as it is. You know, we punch well above our weight, but I think there's probably another opportunity for us to kick on again. Yeah, well, that's what everybody's always looking for. It, it, it's how to improve and, and what's coming next. In terms of the way the game is being played at the moment, uh, do you do you try and and say I have a philosophy about how I'm going to how, how my team is going to play, or? Uh, I guess it's the, the constant chicken or egg or do you wait and see what players you have available and go well our game plan is going to take full cognizance of the fact that this is the skill set that I have available to me yeah I, I don't know I've, I've never had to do that uh, you know I'm a forwards coach now so I, I, I do find I can get on board with any game plan I can I can I can 
I can believe in any game plan really quickly, you know. Uh, you know, whether it was Joe Schmidt's way or Andy's way or or even the way Munster were playing under Razi Erasmus because it brought us success. I can I can learn it quickly and 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 believe in it I find. So uh but I wouldn't have any one particular way that I would that I would believe in playing. Maybe that'll come in time with more coaching or whatever. And is that is that because you want to uh Wait and see what players you have, and also what skill set of the players, as opposed to like, because there are definitely there are definitely teams, rightly or wrongly, everybody believes Warren Gatlin plays a certain way, and as a result, he picks players who are a certain yeah. body shape and who have a certain skill set, and yeah. he bristles whenever we have brought that up before, particularly the phrase Warren Ball. He thinks it's terrible, but like the the evidence would suggest that he has a style of play that he believes in that's been highly successful for him. Joe Street, you could argue the same thing. Um, from your perspective, is are you so far away from having to make those decisions, or I probably am f- so far away from having to make those decisions. And you know, as the forwards coach, my job is to get on board with whatever way we're playing. And I really don't. I, I can believe, you know, it doesn't matter how we've played. I've always believed that this is this is the way. I don't know, uh, you know, Joe, Rob, Penny, um, like so so. I do think you have to know what you stand for, really, though, as as a coach or, or as a team. You have to really believe in what you're doing, um, and that's the identity thing. Because yeah. I, I talk about like the teams need an identity, and people are like, "What are you talking about?" It's, but it's essentially that everybody goes out and everybody understands exactly what their job is. Um, yeah. Paddy Andrews was talking about Jim Gavin and how uh, Jim Gavin would say, your job is not to kick 10 points and play, although if you do, that's very nice. Your job is to do your job. Yeah. Would, they would ask him, what, what's your job? And he would go, that is your job. You do that job. And and if everybody along the way, and off, again, obviously it was a remarkable team they had, but if everybody's doing their job and everybody understands what that is, that's the team's identity. And yeah. the rest of the world is going to see that very quickly because yeah. it's made manifest. Yeah. Like if you look at Toulouse, they they have a certain way of of playing. If you look at us, even Munster back in the mid two thousands, you know we probably were a reflection of Munster Senior Cup rugby in some ways. And then we probably had the personnel. You know, Raj was a, an amazing kicker. So we were playing. We weren't playing it probably as pedantically as as Razi Erasmus was, but we were playing a similar style of rugby to South Africa. You know because. We had a very good line out, very good line out mall, very good defensive line out, very good kicker. We were very fit, so kick chase, all that kind of stuff was good for us, and we we could put teams under pressure defensively. So, you know, even though we would have never had it written up in the wall, or we would have never had a presentation maybe like Razzie does about this is how they are going to play the game, or Munster were going to play under him. That that was how we played because that was our kind of identity at the time. Yeah. Um, and Toulouse are, are like that in, 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 in France I don't think they'll ever play any other way now um, and they recruit based on that they, they, their kids are brought up playing like that um, and it's, it's pretty amazing to watch Do you know what Ireland's identity is at the moment? Is that still being worked out? I think one of the things that I hope will always be part of our identity is our smarts as as, as rugby players. You know, um, I think that's you know you you can always talk about New Zealand. You know, passing offloading South Africa will always be big and strong, and the mall will be important, and the scrum will be important. And you know, if you grew up watching Ireland in the nineties, you know we didn't a lot win a lot of rugby. I think since that group of players came through in 2000 that Warren Gatlin picked I think we've been smart you know in how we've gone about things as an Irish team um, we've always been smart and uh, um, you know I hope that'll continue I'd say the, the way we play will evolve and change all the time but I just think we have to we have to make sure that our, our smarts as rugby players is something we're always Always uh, looking to looking to utilise. Well, that, I mean that's a pretty good identity because it means that when you talked earlier on about watching the mall for TV and trying to solve that problem, it sounds like what you're trying to do is to get your players to solve the problems on the pitch as they arise. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you have to have a strategy, and then you just have to have really good players because it's never going to happen exactly how you how you how you imagine it's going to happen. So. You need people that can adapt then. So you you go out with a strategy you believe in and then 
you're, you're hoping that they can use their 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 intellect as players to adapt to a situation. In in terms of um, that evolution of the the game plan, you've yeah, essentially only been there since I think January this year. Is that right? Yeah. So it's not very long. How how long do you feel it needs for your imprint to be there? Do you feel it was? Yeah, well, I'm I'm listen. You know, I I don't quote the the attack or or, or the defence. You know, we we. I, um, so, you know, I I assist in all those things with the with the defensive coaches and the attack coaches and um, how long I suppose you know we we have we have a way of playing which I must say I really enjoy I think the players really enjoy um, but we have to be able to play different ways as well based on the moment I even read there was an article in the currency there and. Uh, Paul Flynn was talking about um, he he attempted a point from the sideline when they were about seven points up against Mayo, I think, and uh, and the game at the time that wasn't the way to play. I would imagine Jim Gavin would have wanted him to go backwards and hold on to the ball yeah. and not give Mayo. So Mayo then get a kick out, they catch that kick out, they knock it over the bar then they score a goal and then or maybe it was five points next minute it's a draw and, we're, and they're into extra time the game at that time didn't uh, warrant him having a, 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 a I suppose a risky point effort and that's what we have to be able to do is be able to do what the game requires and you know as coaches then we have to equip them, equip them to be able to make those decisions based on what the game requires OK so that's essentially where we're going the, the, the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about was the uh, built in obsession in Irish rugby with the World Cup and getting over quarter final <laughs> how do you deal with this and how, how do we as a, as a culture stop it being the only thing that ever matters in Irish rugby because even your, the next team selections whatever they are everybody's going to be talking about what does this mean for the World Cup and you guys can't even begin to think like that, and yet at the same time, it's in the back of everybody's heads. It's not the only thing that matters to me, and it never—it wasn't when I was playing. You know, when the World Cup comes around, it's really, really important. It's incredibly important. It's the biggest competition we have, um, and sure, there's a little bit of a monkey there now because we haven't managed to do it. But um, I just don't think we can uh, we can afford to think like that as 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 a country because. But we do, unfortunately. You know, like you know that everybody's obsessed with it. That it ends up being the kind of prism through which all decisions are viewed. No, you might be obsessed with it, and uh, and and other people. I, I'm certainly not, and I, I don't sense that from the coaching staff either. It's good that you aren't, though, because there's like we definitely are. As a, I would say, as a as a rugby culture, maybe the playing staff and the coaching yeah. staff can't afford to be. Yeah, we can't be. You know, we're not. I suppose we're four professional teams. You know, we we have to. You know, we we have to keep developing players, uh, certainly for the long term, um, but also we want to keep keep winning and keep competitive all the time. And uh, you know, I don't think anyone, even though I remember people talking about New Zealand trying to develop, where they had three people in every position you know I can't ever remember them really uh, making any game a development game or, or, or going on a tour and, and looking at it purely as development or anything I, I, they were always competitive they were always you know anyone that got in there and got capped for them uh, deserved it and you know I think it's the same for us So the point is create the winning culture and then we'll deal with that when it comes up yeah, absolutely. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, I do enjoy it. Yeah, very much. Enjoy the people. Enjoy the guys we work with. There's a real mixed bag of personalities, which is great. Uh, you know, it's great for me. I work very closely with John Fogarty, uh, who's very, very different to me. Um, you know, he's always talking about the different colours. You know, those personality profiles yes. that people do. That's a big thing in Leinster. <laughs> yes, he's always, he's always, uh, you know, whenever I start getting impatient with him, he's always saying, bear with me now, bear with me. I know, I know that you're impatient and I know you want me to get straight to the point, but can we trash this out? And he just, with his manner, you know, you, you end up enjoying it and laughing. So we, we, we have, I've really enjoyed working with him. Andy, obviously, I worked on the lines in 2013. He's incredible and I'm, I'm just getting to know my cat. I've known Simon for a long time, played with him, coached by him. Terrific guy, but very... 
different to me as well. So, so I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, they're very good coaching staff and good people to Is work with. Is it the with. right level of obsession and involvement now uh, uh, with 12 games a year, or do you see yourself getting into club at some point where it's? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm delighted to be involved in in this job and this role. And I, and I, you know, a lot of coaches I speak to, you know, they don't look beyond it, and I, I'm not looking beyond it either. It's it's great for me as well in that. I get to live in Limerick, you know, we get to, you know, kids love their school, um, you know, both grandparents are still around, thanks be to God, and we get to spend lots of time with them, so, you know, it's, you know, back involved with a team that I love, that I, I've, you know, been a big part of my life, so, and, and living home, so as I said, it's it's brilliant from that regard, but I do love the job as well, yeah. Being at home means you get uh, plenty of time to uh, to cook as well. Have you done any of the other recipes Great in the book? Look. Uh, my wife did one of them there's, uh, there's chicken satay it's kind of chicken made with peanut butter uh, she did that yesterday I did I did ask did you do any of the other ones you're like not me no it was my, no. It was my <laughs> wife <Yeah. laughs> do you do any of the cooking I do uh, I used to do a lot an awful lot when I was playing um, I'm out of the house a little bit more now so um, she's doing the majority of it I probably need to up my game a little bit to be honest with you 11 euros 99 available exclusively in Aldi stores and they've got an ambitious target of trying to raise a million quid by the end of 2022 but it's good to be ambitious so Aldi and the IRFU and all the profits are going towards Barnardo's Paul Connell thanks very much thanks Joe cheers Pat Nevin is with us on this Monday evening good evening Pat good evening how are you doing um, not, not in the best of microphones tonight I'm on my travels just now so uh Apologies if it sounds a bit echoey. It's all right. We won't ask for a song. We'll just go with the pure football <laughs> analysis and keep it simple this evening. Uh, I, I wish it was, as always, just pure football analysis, but a big story this evening around events at Stamford Bridge at the weekend, and a video was posted on social media that appeared to show the Villa midfielder John McGinn was being subjected to sectarian abuse during the game against Chelsea. He was being called a Fenian bastard. Uh, he is a Scottish international, played for Hibernian before he made the move to Aston Villa. Chelsea have this evening come out in condemnation of this. I know as well that you've seen it and you've come out in condemnation. We just keep having these same conversations, it seems, though. Yeah, um, I actually was driving down from Scotland to London for the Chelsea game tomorrow night. So I'm, I'm here in London now. I stopped off at the service station and I saw a picture of John again, who happens to be one of my favourite players. And was one of them before I actually moved down to England. Um, but it has nothing got to do with it. Um, the fact that the, those words were actually said, don't care who it is, who it's aimed at, it doesn't matter. It's utterly and completely unacceptable. So, you know, I don't usually, I don't actually tweet a lot, um, but I was, I was just angry, and I immediately said, look, unbelievably unacceptable. This has to be a. The, the club will do the right thing because I know what Chelsea are like. They will get right on top of it. They will say all the right things and they will do the right things. They will try and find out who this human being is, inverted commas human being. And uh, I, I, I posted that immediately. Um, within about half an hour, I'd spoke to the top people at uh, Stamford Bridge who said, yes, we're on it. Don't worry. We are doing everything we can. They spoke to Villa. Um, and it's it's great that the only positive out of it is the fact that yeah, you've got this one. I, I don't want to say cred or, or better. You put your own sobriquet in there, um, saying this. But the fact that the club, the league, and possibly the law will come down hard on them—that's um, the way it's got to be. You're always going to have uh, these people. They, they exist in the society, um, but, but they're not welcome. They're not welcome at football clubs. And certainly, I'm delighted that English football it happens to be Chelsea. This, and it doesn't matter if it's Chelsea. Mm. Just come down hard and make sure you do and say the right things. And uh, the only positive I can see out is the fact that they did the right things. And uh, I can tell you for sure, that guy has been searched and searched and searched for right now. And uh, if it's possible to find them, they will. We've seen, uh, it's, it feels as though we've seen again an increase in racist abuse and homophobic abuse. And now we've sectarian abuse. And we, James McLean, in the studio about 18 months ago where he was talking about the sectarian abuse that he received at grounds up and down the country. And we know how serious that became for James McLean. And his sense was it was treated differently, sectarian abuse, from other kinds of abuse. Would that be your sense as well, that for somehow it's not seen as being quite as serious? No, I, I think it is seen as just as serious um, when it comes before people that want to speak about it. Funnily enough, I'd never been at a game where I'd happened to James McLean. Um, 
just so harmed I wasn't at the games that he was playing at. Um, and certainly if I'd have heard that, I'd have been very, very quick on to it. Uh, again, it's totally and utterly unacceptable for that behaviour, wherever it is. There is a perspective to be had here. Um, it isn't that common, the sectarian stuff that I can see. It's there, but it's not as common as the racism, which is still there. You get bits of homophobia now and again. You get all that stuff. We just need to keep on top of it all the time. Uh, my perspective is it's a million times better than it used to be, but it's still not good enough. Mm. So we keep on fighting the good fight, and that's what we'll continue to do. And I'm happy we're doing that. I, I do say to people that if they, it's as bad as ever, I, that's just wrong. I'm afraid it's just wrong. I, I played 20, 25, 30 years ago. It's not like that anymore. But it doesn't matter. That doesn't make it all right. That just means... We're trying to move in the right direction. And every time it rears its head, we're on top of it. And that's what we're trying to do. It's strange when you're at a game and you're at a lot of games and you're working at a game and you've got headphones on and you hear afterwards of an incident and you wonder, should I have heard something at the time and commented at the time? But quite often it's, it's one person or it's one section of the crowd. When you compare that to 25 years ago, when you compare it to the 80s, when you were playing, when you were playing, would you have been aware at times that there were things happening, things been said that were completely inappropriate, that was abusive? Like constantly, right? As in constantly, um, running. I mean, I'm playing on the wing. I'm taking corners. I'm getting dogs abused. I'm getting everything, you know. And it, 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 and I get the law. I mean, I get. I can remember I get the sectarian stuff. I mean, being called Patrick, Kevin, Francis, Michael. I'm. I'm going to get a bit. Right. I, I, mm. I took it, and I kind of just. I shrugged my shoulders and ignored them, and just thought, well, wait a minute. I'm. I'm I, I almost looked down on you if you're going to be like that. Um, I also got stuff that could be xenophobic because it was Scottish. Um, I also got, would you believe, uh, well, well, not surprisingly, homophobic stuff because I look slightly different for some footballers. I had once read a book, so obviously I must be gay in their view. You know, mm. these people that are as slug brained as them. But I got the whole world that's Semitic. I mean, people thought I was Jewish because they had a big nose. Now, to be fair, um, at that time, I knew it was wrong, but I knew I could take it, and it didn't, it, it didn't really bother me. What bothered me was when they had to go to other people, like the black players on my team or anyone who I thought was getting singled out for any unfair reasons. And it infuriated me at the time. And then it just wasn't acceptable to speak out about it. And I did. I spoke out all the time about it. I was, I was regularly, and I was thought an oddball for doing it. I'm just doing exactly the same now as I've ever done. Um, and it's just great that, you know, you're on the top of this. I've been talking to lots of media people today, and they're all on top of it. And that's brilliant. Because you know what? See, in the past, they weren't. And this is a, a positive step forward. So, yeah, let's stay angry. Let's stay annoyed. Let's keep on top of it. Um, but don't necessarily say it's bad as it ever was, because it isn't. Mm. It, it all moves so quickly now that, you know, Rio Ferdinand was in front of a Commons committee, I think it was last week, talking about the Euro 2020 final. And Rio Ferdinand, I think like everybody else, once the penalties were missed, you knew what was going to happen. And almost oh, yeah. as quickly as the abuse started... The support started as well for the players, but the abuse was still there and the abuse was left there for many weeks for the players if they went on social media. But the support is there, it seems, within the dressing room. There's good leadership in football now, both in the dressing room and outside the dressing room. When it was happening when you were playing and you were talking to those other players in your dressing room, would you have spoken to them about support, about ways you could help? Would that have been a conversation that lots of people were having in the dressing room? Was it appreciated? How did those conversations go? It's very difficult now because, I mean, you'll be aware, I wrote a book about this and it was out about 10 weeks ago that is really dealt with in some detail. So I think I'm going to overall ground and I've been doing this for many, many years. For a lot of people, it was swept under the carpet because that's what culture was then. There was a kind of latent racism sitting there. And I come from Glasgow. So sectarianism surrounded you all the time. It was just there the whole time. So, but I just could never accept it. But I was thought weird because I wouldn't accept it. Um, so yeah, it was there um, I had my ways of dealing with it but I didn't think the other players, particularly black players in our team, when I was at Chelsea they should be, have to deal with it, and they did they, they had to deal with horrendous things then, absolutely horrendous stuff, week in, week out but you know, we started the fight, we, we, we pushed as far as we can and we keep on pushing And but it's like, it's like Sisyphus you, you, you roll in this huge big ball uphill and, you know, it rolls down now and again. But you get back behind it and you roll it back up again. Um, oddly enough, you say there's a lot of support behind you. The sectarianism isn't... Re- I don't find it like that. I don't find that like that. I mean, I've found spoke about immediately about it today. And I've just got... I mean, I've flicked through my Twitter feed. I've got dogs abuse for that. I've got hammered for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so 
Um, well, well that, that would very much go along with what James McLean would say and his annoyance at the time at, say, the lack of support from his teammates. And we've spoken to a lot of his Irish teammates even who are aware that the second you back James McLean, that they are going to receive the exact same level of abuse. And a lot of them feel rightly yeah. or wrongly that when they're playing, they just don't think it's worth the hassle. No, the people that are abusing me were the people who would be on James McLean's side. That's right. the difference. And that's the abuse that I've been getting and I can consistently get, but I don't care because I will always just say what I feel. Um, it will always be twisted. I think what you have to be, you have to be guarded about is the societies and all societies are like that. You get extremists in every area of society and you can't be pushed by them. If you are pushed always by the extremists, You'd, and, you, and by the way, never argue with them. They're wasting their time arguing with extremists. So don't do that. What you do is try and get fairness, try and get an understanding that you are just getting equality and fairness for everyone, and you are not siding with anyone. The extremists on the verges, you're wasting your time with. And I mean verges. I mean one mm. side, other side. And these are all sides. And I do not actually put one side above the other. I really don't. I never have. It's, it doesn't matter, left, right, whatever, whatever. Don't care, religions, don't care. Yeah. The extremists on either side. And if you're on the wrong side of them, you're going to get hammered. And I can tell you, I've been on the wrong side of both of them, and I get hammered. Hmm. Fortunately, I can deal with it, but others, it's much, much harder. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, just to finish up on this then, like you mentioned there that you know Chelsea are investigating and mm. they are going to go whatever way is needed to oh, find yeah. this person. Like, is there anything the clubs can do to stop this? Like, Because you say <sighs> it's a representation of society that ends up in these grounds. That is the main question. It's a question that football fans, many will never ask. Because I've been on the other side of that. I was chief executive of a club in Scotland, right? And uh, just going through a game, and I, I hear an hour after the game, because as you say, you don't always hear everything, that there had been sectarian singing from our fans. And I'm going, what? Motherwell fans? Are you joking? And Celtic, we were playing it today, so we know what kind of sectarian singing that is. So I was doing, I was moving heaven on earth to find out do you know how hard it was to find out particularly in a time when you didn't have particularly good CCTV mm. and the club was being blamed and we'd done everything we had these you know, anti-sectarian anti-homophobic anti-sexism and we had every programme in the world going and the club was just sat there and I, can I tell you one thing about Chelsea when they contacted me tonight I tweeted they didn't contact me because I tweeted they just contacted me because they knew there was a lot going on with us and they know I'm involved in Scotland etc they are furious beyond they are steaming with anger purely because they have done so many good things and worked so many good areas and then you get the odd lunatics come on and do this and then by the then you get a lot of people going saying oh that's Chelsea fans are for you mm. or that's Liverpool fans for you or that's whatever fans for you and of course it's not you know I know every decent football fan knows the vast majority and I like it I told the story earlier on today um, Chelsea fans this is classic typical um, in Scotland, you, you get all this in Ireland. You get it. You hear all this. Again, I use the word opinion, and you, you'll know more about the history than I do about it. Even though I do have the Irish passport and all that, but they said I said to somebody down here, like that sort of stuff. I'd, I'd heard one or two people sort of talking about that, and they went, "Yeah, yeah." I'd, I've vaguely heard. Now, now, which side is which? We don't know. <laughs> That's how knowledgeable these people are. So you you throw these big cast iron things where oh, these fans are like this. You have no idea. They have no, They don't care. They have no interest. The vast majority of them, it is nothing to them. And when it is something to them, it's, they, they just can't stand it. And they think it's stupid. It's the it's the people's liberation, or people's front of Judea against the Judean people's front. It's that sort of stuff in their eyes. That's how they think of it. But see, we're in the wee bubbles of the sectarianism and the religion of your particular area. You think they're all thinking the way you do. They don't. <laughs> they just don't. That's not the way they think about it. So it's, it's trying to get it across that, you know, football clubs have to try and keep them top of it, but they also have to have a perspective that if you have a small number that are encroaching into what is you really your type of club, then you try and wheedle them out. That's what you're trying to do. When you've got a bigger problem and it's masses that are at that, well, that's a different thing. I don't think that's a problem you've got in England, really. I'd imagine this, uh, unfortunately, won't be the last time we're going to be uh, talking about this over the coming well, months. Good, and years Can I say good? Can I say good? Because every time it turns up, talk about it. Because mm. we can't change it until we keep on talking about it. And people like me will keep on coming on and we'll go on and we'll talk away and we'll do our best for equality and fairness and be, be able to be themselves and, and, and walk into a football ground and not be, get hammered this 
garbage in the ears. And we'll always, people like me will also sit here and take it on, on, on Twitter forever or whatever. We don't care. We know we're right. I suppose maybe a bit of surprise. You always hope these things can happen. And I know different from any, any other management around the country. You know, that's what you aspire to. Ultimately, now, you know that you can't think too far ahead of yourself because that's the biggest downfall you'll have. So it's the old cliche of one game at a time. And that's what we don't always we want to do with one basically our first game. And we didn't even do that. Don't all beat us in the National League. And we had a, you know, we got to the semi final of the National League, but it was, we were well, well beaten by Kerry, as we all know that day but you know we probably improved most matches we took the learning on board you know and uh, all credit to our coaches you know and performance analysis people uh, the work they put in Peter, Joey and Collie and Marty McGarren and Dara Barnes and people like that you know to prepare the team for each step and you know we got ourselves ready for the championship and I suppose we just took it one day at a time as usual but and that's where we ended up you know but um we didn't look any further than the next game and I think that's probably the most important thing. You mentioned the Kerry match in the league and listen, whenever you concede 6-15 there's always going to be reaction and a fallout and there were big question marks at that stage about Tyrone. For you as a manager and the management team, like your reaction to that was, that, was that a turning point? Was that a match you still look back on and think, all right, we were going down one path and we had to change it slightly or is that overstating it? Well, we all, we all look at each other to be honest, we know we had a look at um, both ourselves as minds and, and the players as well for the performance. You know, a lot of people had a um, a lot of people had a look at themselves after that and see what could we do better or what weren't we doing. You know, and um, that's, I suppose it's you can say it's a turning point. I don't know. Um, people may think it is. People may think it isn't. It's everything's in hindsight now, but it definitely probably helped us. We had serious amount of work to do to stop shipping goals you know and um, thankfully we've done that during the championship and we by and large addressed that you know mm. for the championship OTB AM with Gillette put your best face forward